Okay, why don't Patty can call the roll. Uh, McQueen. Yes. Here. Sims. Here. Pausch. Here. Intro. Yes. Um, not present is uh, Council Member Judith Hempling. Uh, also present, uh, Assistant Village Manager, Finance Director, Melissa Dodd. Um, Park Streets, Wastewater Superintendent, Jason Handy, and Electric and Water Distribution, Johnny Burns. Uh, Solicitor Chris Connard and Clerk of Council Judy Kintner have entered. Yes, thank you. Um, so announcements. Um, I'll, I have one. Um, this Thursday uh, at 9 a.m. we have a chamber chat. This one will actually be held at the Senior Center. Uh, the subject is cybersecurity and uh, Randall East from Tech Advisors and I assume Bartley Davis will be there uh, to talk about issues of cybersecurity for your business and your personal um, computer. And it's obviously a lot is happening these days, so I think it's a pretty important subject. So uh, everyone is welcome to that, whether you're a chamber member or not. Uh, yeah, I had a few. Um, so first of all, I did want to mention that uh, August 9th is the deadline for petitions for folks that are interested in uh, running for elected office for the November election. And, um, and to clarify, which I know the YS News will do as well, there are three uh, open seats um, for uh, Village Council. Um, also, if you didn't get a chance to see Julius Caesar last weekend, you have another weekend this Friday and Saturday at Mills Lawn School. Uh, it's amazing. Um, on July 22nd, we have um, the 365 Project, one of their um, walking tours that are highlighting um, uh, black uh, African Americans in Yellow Springs. And that starts at 1 p.m. at Mills Lawn, uh, at, sorry, at Mills Park Hotel, at least from there. And finally, um, we have uh, announced the next Village Inspiration and Design Award, and it's going to the House of Ohm. If you haven't been to King's Yard in the last couple days, uh, check it out because the uh, award that uh, the traveling trophy that John Hudson created is there. And um, there's a reception open to the public on July 26th from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, I have. I have a press release that we've been given uh, about uh, a forum on Friday, July 28th in this building in the, in the gymnasium um, called An Open Forum on Concerns Regarding Understanding Mental Illness and Addictions. And um, the woman who's presenting the forum is Alicia Williams, who uh, has a Bachelor of Science from Antioch College and is a social worker. And I, and I don't know anything more about this. Maybe there will be something in the paper or some other information about the presentation. Uh, anyway, it's free and uh, open to the public. And if you, there's a voluntary $5 donation if you wish. Okay. I know that there's something happening on the, a, twen a training on the 20th. Pat. It's, oh, okay. I thought our cap training. Should. Johnny, do you have that map that you were going to get? Um, yes. Um, the Rural Communities Assistance Program has asked um, our utilities departments to uh, participate in a field day, a training field day. And uh, this is in my report. We will have um, some road closures. I think Quarry Street is going to be closed at a certain point. Uh, and he's pointing to Jason. So, Jason, do you know what the road closures specifically will be? I, I think now what Johnny and I talked about we're going to Glen at Quarry. Can you come up, please, so that people can? Well, our cap is coming out, and there there are going to be about a hundred visitors in town just for this training and event. Many of them are staying overnight. And yeah, and the, the logistics are still trying to be ironed out. Um, we're having a lot of issues with people trying to get in because it's such a huge draw. But right now we have Glen Street at Cory shut down, and then we're going to have uh, North Fairfield underneath the bridge shut down as well. So Will those be all day or just part of the day, do you know? Those will be part of the day, but they'll have all day training going on, so we'll be having it back and forth. So we'll, we'll try to keep it closed most of the day, but we'll...
everybody know. I've already let Miami Township know. Mm -hmm. I'll let the fire department know and the, and the police department as well. And I mean, since we're talking about it, uh, <laughs> there was some public engagement opportunity to see how equipment works? Yes. Um, RCAP has said that if somebody is walking by or driving by and they want to see the piece of equipment that's being uh, um, demonstrated and people are being trained on, they're welcome to stop. Um, you know, just be aware of the safety precautions if someone asks you to, to not stand somewhere or whatever. But the public is welcome to stop and uh, see those demonstrations and participate in some small way to understand a little bit better what the crews do and, and how they affect the utilities, that kind of thing. Um, and parking will be at a premium at both the Bryan Center and uh, the lot at uh, 102 Dayton because we are having so many people come to the <coughs> party. So. Okay, great, thank you. That should be fun. And then I have two more if everyone else. Okay. Um, we do have peak shaving coming up three days this week. Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are supposed to be some of the hottest days of the year so far, all in the uh, 90 or above category. So there is peak <coughs> shaving from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Also, on Monday, July 24th, they will be replacing the 16-inch water main at the water plant. This is the main that carries the finished water out into the system. So we are, we will not be producing water at the plant on Monday. Um, you should watch for discolored water. And we are also asking residents to conserve water um, Monday through Wednesday or until such time as we post a notice that you don't have to anymore. We're not expecting any problems with replacing this line, um, but we will be running entirely off of the towers during the period that the line is being replaced. So please be cognizant of that and please be patient with the brown water if you do experience it. It's because we're replacing this large line. Thanks, Patty. Just to remind people that this is all part of the progress of getting a new water plant and there will be um, some bumps in the road along the way as we make the transition over. Um, so this will probably not be the first time we ask for patience as we, uh, as we go online with that plant um, and get ready to go online. Um, next we have the consent agenda. Uh, we have the minutes of July 3rd, uh, regular meeting and financials for June of 2017. Can I have a uh, motion please? Uh, I, oh, I have a concern about the financials. Okay. So I, I'll do. Shall I just state? So I guess we'll just pull it out. Pull okay. It out. Okay. Or I guess we don't have to. I mean, we can just take the vote. Why don't we, you know, just address your concerns, your questions, Melissa? I guess would be. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's actually to Council and Jerry. I guess. Okay. Um, I don't feel very competent at looking at the whole how many forty some pages of financials every month and I'm concerned that maybe some of us sometimes don't and yet we're approving them and that concerns me. I'm, I mean, I'm not saying I, don't, I think there's any problem with them but I don't feel real comfortable approving something that I haven't really thoroughly read and it feels like over the top to thoroughly read it. So that's a concern I have. I mean, Jerry, are you, are you thoroughly, I mean, I just yeah, like I to guess, know that this is yeah, really being vetted. The, the only other thing would be, I don't know how er, how much earlier we can get them out. Um, I I put them in to the second packet um, or the second second meetings packet because I get the bank statement online. I, I mean, they don't even mail them until after the first week, so the 7th or the 8th of the month, but I get them online ahead of time so I can start reconciling. So the soonest I can get it in is this meeting unless I do it a month later. Actually, what I'm saying is I think that it is over the top to expect each council member to read through 40-some okay. pages. Can, so this is a new phenomenon. It, it's only been in the past couple of years that we've been approving these financials. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's been Audit. just mandated by the state? Mm -hmm. The auditor actually, um, the auditor actually um, cited us because financials were not presented to council on a regular basis. So that's why we do it. 
but what does that mean? A regular basis is that is that once a um, month? Is there? Is it? Could it be once a quarter? Could we take a, a maybe a half an hour during a quarter to, to review them? I can and have it that. as a more formal process. I can clarify that. Yeah, certainly. Okay. I would appreciate. Yeah, and and the, and the other thing, you know, if Melissa has some concerns with them, she lets me know. Mm -hmm. So and. Uh, it, they've been pretty standard uh, as of late, but uh, well, I, I guess I also wonder, um, you know, could you know if we could highlight some trends um, mm -hmm. in the financials? That might be a good way just to kind of you know do like a top level overview. Um, I mean, I do always look at them. They seem like they're there's not a whole lot of excitement which is probably good mm -hmm. um, but that being said yeah maybe you know like Karen said if quarterly we could do that like and have high an level agenda item a separate agenda item <laughs> yep well we, we could probably bring back some pie charts and oh, yeah. and so forth on a quarterly basis and mm -hmm. so on too. but that doesn't necessarily alleviate Marianne's concerns about this 40 page document that we're getting that we're getting every month uh, well, we'll check, but right now, like I say, it, it wasn't an audit finding. Right, that right, so it's important that we do them. this. So, you know, we, well, it would certainly make a difference, I think, know. to actually spend some time going over it quarterly. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll check. Let's see if we can do that. So, I'll check. Um, let's go ahead and take the vote okay. now. We'll see. Um, if you want to abstain, Marianne, you're welcome no, to do I, that. I mean, I did look at them. Yeah. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Did we wait? Do no, we have the yeah. motion in the first? <laughs> no. Okay. Mm -hmm. You made a motion. Well, I made a motion. I know if you got a second. A second. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Um, moving on to a review of the agenda. Do we have anything we want to add or change in the agenda? Okay, we will, um, Brian, would you review the petitions and communications, please? Yeah, so actually two of our communications we had on the table uh, at our last meeting, um, but I'll just mention them again. Um, one was the short letter from Bruce Bratmiller mentioning that he didn't have a strong opinion about the lodging tax, but he thought it should apply to uh, everybody that uh, it could apply to if we were going to uh, levy one. Um, and then also we had the letter from John Gudgel supporting the um, village policing guidelines, uh, in particular highlighting um, some of the suggestions that the 365 project mentioned, which we did discuss at length at the last meeting. And then the last thing is we uh, had two um, press releases from Green County Public Health. One of those was highlighting um, crash statistics uh, for this year. Um, most of the problems have to do with distracted driving, um, but one thing that was notable was uh, uh, a minimal of accidents uh, caused by drunk driving. And then the second one was about uh, ticks in particular, and uh, it's a two-page document that highlights a lot of, um, I guess, tactics for minimizing some of the terrible things that ticks can cause. Thank you. Uh, moving on to public hearings and legislation. First is resolution 2017-37. Uh, we can read this in by title only, Judy. All right, this is authorizing the village manager to enter into an amendment to the Cemetery Street Development Agreement with Yellow Springs Home Inc. to remove language requiring construction of a berm. Can I get a motion, please? I move. Second. Okay. Um, Emily was at the last meeting um, really talking about another project, but um, we did address this. Um, Patty, why don't you go ahead? You, you did prepare the information that we discussed. Oh, uh, absolutely. The um, village entered into the development agreement with Home Inc. for the four lots on Cemetery Street, and that development agreement required um, either the village or Home Inc. to put a berm in um, to divide the rest of the property, the remaining property owned by the village, from those four lots. Home Inc. has asked that that berm requirement be waived and uh, it's my understanding that council I was not here at the last meeting but that council did agree to waive that berm as we no longer believe that we will make that a parking lot and if we do make it a parking lot we can add the berm later 
Right. And the, the responsibility for the for the berm was pretty ambiguous. Yes, it said it either the village or home inc. So um, since it really at this point doesn't appear necessary, and I do believe that there were some, I, and I know this is a totally separate discussion, but there was some debris. Some it's gone. It's gone. Perfect. So um, things are things are kind of back to normal on Cemetery they, Street. They are home inc. Removed the the debris and the the pile of dirt, and um, they're back. I think Jason's crew is uh, maintaining our part of that property on a regular basis, and we're where we need to be right now. Great. Jason, do, do you know if people park there on the weekends? They do? Okay, good. Uh, do you know if they're mostly using the bike trail or? Uh, most, mostly just walking downtown. Mm -hmm. I, um, one of the local guys that lives here said that once the Xenia Avenue builds up, that's where they start parking. Great, okay. Almost like street fair. Like local. Okay, well thanks. Um, any questions or comments from council? Comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. And then the next one, Judy. Title only? Yes. This is awarding a contract for utility, electric utility line clearing and tree trimming. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, Patty, you're going to take that. We're going to ask Johnny to. You want to take you know. Um, this is the annual line clearing um, that the village does every year around the electric poles. Um, it went out for competitive bid, as has been uh, the case in the past several years. Arbor Care was the low bidder at $92,000. Um, this will be Section 4, which I believe is fair acres and up. Um, so it looked like it was actually farther south than fair acre. fair acres. Fair acres and Dayton south. Street. There it is. Yes, fair acres and Pleasant south street to Dayton Street. It. Yes, I see it. Okay. And that includes the Bryan Center and Cemetery Street as well. Great. So, Patty, since uh, I, I guess it's coming up a little bit later, is this ninety-two thousand part of the nine hundred thousand in clearing that needs to be done, or is this kind of a different? No, the nine hundred, the nine hundred thousand that you're talking about that was cited in the fiber project mm -hmm. is from the. Is it the three-phase, Johnny? The secondary below. The secondary below. With this is for the secondary and above. We only trim up into the wires. Okay. We don't trim that the necessarily the bottom access because that would be, first of all, we'd be cutting down a lot of things that a lot of residents want to keep. But secondly, it would be an enormous cost to us. And okay. so what we trim is what keeps it out of the wires and thereby minimizes disruptions to the surface. Thanks. And coordination with neighbors, and that's all taken care of ahead of time. Yes, ma'am. Arbor Care takes care of that. Great. At least a week before they come. Great. Thank you. Um, any comments or questions? Comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, now is the time in the agenda where we hear from uh, citizens about items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you come to the uh, podium and uh, state your name and uh, keep your remarks to three minutes. Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on. Um, next we've got uh, the Fiber, Fiber Advisory Board report. Um, how is that going to move forward? Are we going to have? Um, I, Tim, I, yeah, I am okay. going to introduce Tim Barhorst and Scott Five from SpringsNet slash Village Managers Fiber Advisory Board. Okay. Good evening. Um, as uh, Patty said, my name is Tim Barhorst, and um, at the previous uh, Managers Advisory Board meetings, we uh, discussed the fact that public funding is limited and the village council and staff thinks the risk of failure <coughs> based on interpretation of the design nine report is, is pretty high. And there are additional concerns about the cost of building a network uh, and the resulting cost of service. And there seem to be also concerns that the network would possibly contribute to a gentrification of the village and higher housing costs. So along with the challenge and the expense of the tree trimming, which we just uh, discussed, uh, the, uh, the alleyways, which by the way, uh, Scott Fife and I took a tour with Johnny uh, a couple weeks ago of the alleyways, and they, they are sincerely blocked by a lot of overgrowth. And uh, I think it's, you know, there's, there's some hazardous 
places where equipment and trucks just cannot get through. And at some point that needs to be addressed. Um, so there are other infrastructure projects that are obviously using a lot of tax dollars. The new water plant, the fire station, potential tax increases for new school buildings. Uh, so property taxes are already high enough. So uh, one, one point we do feel uh, is worth investigation is still looking at a revenue bond as a possibility uh, without spending a great deal of money and time looking at that. Um, we took another look at the Design 9 report, including financial spreadsheet data, and we just want to make note of the following areas. Uh, the other cost on the summary tab of a spreadsheet that included tree trimming uh, included a particularly large amount for project management. Uh, it's worth further discussion. Uh, the 900K for tree trimming could be distributed among multiple village projects. There's $427,000 project management figure which seemed remarkably high to us and could possibly be avoided depending on the uh, chosen vendor. Project management could also be handled by local resources. Um, another item that we thought was worth looking at or reviewing at least mentioning is the 113000 in office expenses. If the service is managed as a contracted service, this would not make any sense. The staff salary item is also much more than anticipated and would seem to imply village operation without contracted support. So we believe Design 9 has overlooked a number of critical advantages that Yellow Springs holds over most municipalities considering such a project, including the relatively small, compact, and static village footprint, which is easier to plan and we require less fiber optic cable, the significant value added by the presence and mission of Mefeca within the village, and the history of the village as a public utility provider. So the Scenario 1 model, Design 9, that they presented in the report, we think with substantial variations warrants further investigation. So in that light, the directive was to find alternative methods to build and finance a fiber network for the village that attracts new business, is in sync with community values, and emphasizes affordability. So a group of us on June 23rd uh, had a conference call with Deb Socha of Next Century Cities. And along that same time, we also heard from Chris Missel, Mitchell of the Institute for Self-Reliance. Uh, the following were some recommendations they made. Uh, the first one was that more strategic planning is very important and a must for our village. So in that light, we consulted with Jory Wolf. He's the former CIO of Santa Monica, California CityNet. Uh, he's currently a consultant for Magellan Associates and he made a commitment to me to promise uh, to give an additional analysis of the Design 9 summary, which I expect to see in the next couple of weeks. Uh, second recommendation was that public-private <coughs> excuse me, partnerships should be investigated. So we contacted Ting and ACD uh, from Michigan. Um, I just talked to Thor Sage that this afternoon and we expect a proposal of some sort from ACD very soon. Uh, Ting didn't seem so much so interested, but uh, the the uh, the person at Ting was very encouraging about our uh, endeavors, um, and she said uh, to continue trying. Uh, she said it is it's very difficult. Uh, another recommendation was that uh, an incremental step-by-step -step approach could be considered. Uh, you could build out small sections that are affordable in neighborhoods that seem to already have a high interest level. Uh, it was a conversation on a conference we had with an uh, individual named Bruce Patterson from Ammon, Idaho, and he uses the, what's called local improvement districts. Um, very enlightening conversation for any of those that want to uh, listen to the to the uh, conference call. There's a link there in uh, in the uh, included in the packet. Uh, another recommendation was to investigate the cooperative model. Uh, we, we were researching a model utilized by RS Fiber in Minnesota, and in that light we had a conference call with a gentleman named Mark Erickson on June 27th. Uh, he formed, along with uh, several other principals, a cooperative named RS Fiber. It consists of multiple municipalities that sold general obligation tax abatement bonds at 4.5% and loaned those funds to the co-op, and the co-op in turn makes payments. Um, so. Another recommendation was to reduce costs. We should consider cooperative relationships with other regional partners uh, like Greene County or Cedarville. And we happen to know that Cedarville has already formed a cooperative and we're going to be in further conversation with them about that. Um, the last uh, 
recommendation was to get firm commitments from citizens and especially businesses and do some more public outreach and get pe more people involved. So in conclusion, there remains a convincing case for the development of a fiber optic municipal network in our village. We are currently examining public-private partnerships as well as forming a nonprofit or a cooperative. At this point, we are leaning towards the nonprofit cooperative model. And along with operation and management of the network, the, the nonprofit could also do three other things. It could provide training and mentoring to local people, that is, people that have lived in the village a certain length of time and Yellow Springs High School graduates, to prepare them for jobs in the IT field. It might also work with, uh, with the relationship with the, with the schools. It could provide assistance to local small businesses to help improve their use of broadband and information technology with the goal of helping them expand their employment of local people. And third, it could help Yellow Springs seniors and families with kids in school get a computer and provide basic training in how to use it. We think the nonprofit would have a minimal staff. It would organize and leverage volunteers and existing programs. It would facilitate networking and provide a neutral and a trusted place to get broadband and technology assistance. It would also make a commitment to having a reduced subscription or connection rate for low-income households, including people that live in home incorporated houses in Green Met. Uh, the federal broadband lifetime, lifeline program could also provide part of the subsidy. So continued work on strategic planning for the village is vitally important. Having conducted significant research into building and operating a municipal fiber to the premise network as members of the SpringNet group, <coughs> The goals of the project outlined to Council in February 2016 remain achievable, vital to our economic future, and consistent with our character as a progressive community. Our goal is a network that is inclusive, affordable for all, and one that encourages the kind of business growth and development that is in alignment with the values of Yellow Springs. If appropriate sources of funding can be obtained, we believe this network can contribute greatly to the affordability solution instead of being part of the problem. So we're continuing our research and we'll report future findings to council as they become available. Thank you, that's it. Any thank questions? You. Yes. Um, first, I, I would really like to thank you guys, I guess it's all guys, <laughs> for continuing to work on this. Um, I know it from the report that we had it seemed like it could be very expensive but I also think it would be really vital to our community so I really appreciate that you're volunteering your time we all feel very strong and we're going to be meeting again in the near future so I had two questions from your report the on the first recommendation you said more strategic planning is a must for our village so the question is <coughs> is this in general or in particular about this that's the first question and the other question is where, who in Cedarville is doing the co-op? Is it the village government or the it's, university? It's, uh, from my understanding, and I haven't talked personally to anybody at Cedarville, Thor Sage has been leading that effort. Uh, it's, uh, from what I understand, though, it's primarily a lot of the businesses in Cedarville are gathered mm -hmm. together to do this. There aren't a lot of businesses Well, there. Right. <laughs> but that being said, I've attended a couple meetings, and it is the small businesses in yeah. town. I mean, uh, the university is is uh, is part of this, but it really has been driven by the businesses. Hmm. Um, I, I I would like to get back to you on the, the strategic planning because this consultant I've talked to, uh, uh, Jory, uh, he went on for about a half hour talking about how all these things inter fit together in Santa Monica, California. Now they're a much larger community, but he didn't see any issue with with you know our size as being making it whether as a doable project or not um, I mean strategic planning is things like you know dig once policies and things like that that interconnect with what the fiber would do for the village in terms of other utilities so um, I don't know Scott do you have anything to say about strategic planning <laughs> um, it was it was a recommendation and there there uh, that the uh, Deb Soship really uh, gave to us about you know seeing things through from top to bottom not just the fiber project in other words how it interconnects with other projects do, do you believe that there's grant funding out there available for a nonprofit entity um, 
If we expanded our horizons a little bit and started looking at rural areas, there's, there's federal funding that could be applied for that. I know that for a fact. Uh, for the village itself, uh, I haven't seen a lot of available grant money. Uh, in Idaho, he was able to get some grants from the state. Uh, as well as uh, I think he got, he had a whole combination of, of money, but they did pass a uh, bond in Idaho. I mean, I do know that in the, in the county, in the rural areas of the county, it's a huge problem. The library is actually going to start, it's going to purchase and distribute, or not just purchase for distribution with your library card hotspots that are, uh, that people can go in and get for a week because there are areas of the county, I mean, if a student's writing a paper, they don't have any internet access. So it is a, it is a huge problem. So um, <coughs> any way that that could be connected in would be a boon to the project and for the county also. Well, that would be one valid, uh, a big advantage of a co-op is that we could expand our horizons a little bit and wouldn't have to necessarily limit it to the village mm -hmm. boundary mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. And Green County has been at the table with the Cedarville project, so that's promising. So, uh, yeah, we're, we'll probably be in further communication with them. Uh, I know Thor has had, aside from Brian, has had a couple conversations with him about it. Well, and it, and, and also, um, I you know, I, Thor's doing things north too. So, you know, connecting in with Clark County and and you know, mm. things that are going on up 68 wouldn't wouldn't hurt either. We can cross cross county lines mm. for sure. Sure. Okay. Is there any role with the Economic Sustainability Commission in this? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I think you guys were planning to come to a, a meeting, was that? Uh, I think there were some discussions about that, nothing's right. been set up, but I think that would be an excellent idea yeah. to further some uh, communication there. Definitely. Yeah, I, I mean, I will highlight um, one of the conversations I was on was the uh, Ammon, uh, Idaho uh, model. and. It was really interesting because it's totally driven by the citizens. So, you know, and, and that's where they've cut out the risk by basically, you know, if people want it, they're going to invest in it. And, uh, and he was and surprised about how many invested in it in a very conservative Donald Trump type community. Were they served? Uh, they, they were served. Mm -hmm. Well, some of them were. It, uh, uh, the, uh, the logistics of how he did it, though, were, was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I think they had, similar to us, he had a cable provider and an AT&T DSL offering and stuff like that. It was mm -hmm. very, because Ammon, Idaho, isn't a whole lot larger than Yellow Springs. I think there were about 10,000. Mm -hmm. So uh, he made it work. And he, I mean, if we could hire him, we might be able to figure <laughs> something out. I have a question for you. I want to point to your conclusion. You talked about you were leaning more toward a nonprofit cooperative model. Mm -hmm. Am I hearing that to say that the village itself would not be a part of it? it would, well, what am there, I reading there could be this? some possible uh, covenants. Uh, the nonprofit, in our preliminary estimate, would be actual. Would be you know managing and administering the network, and perhaps also building it out but would probably need some financial assistance from the municipality to, to finance some of it. Um, so it, that's one model. There's a number of ways a nonprofit could work, but it would, would offload the village as being the primary uh, you know, entity responsible for the network. Jerry, in, in my recommendation um, where, um, where I say that I think that it's wise to let SpringsNet investigate the co-op model because I think that that is the best way for us to go. The village can do things like um, give free pole attachments and, and work and things like that. And if the if the nonprofit comes back to the village in the future for something else, you know we can certainly discuss it. Uh, yeah, this one. Mark Erickson in, in Minnesota used a whole variety of financing methods for these six or seven municipalities that, that banded together, but the co-op actually manages and runs the network. But he actually got loans from the municipalities. And uh, with, with a contingency that if their uh, payments on the loans ran short, that they would, uh, every residence would, would pay uh, uh, an increase, a slight increase in property tax, like ten dollars more a month, if they didn't make the payment. And so far, he's made all the payments. 
Um, and plus he got a bank loan and a couple other sources of funding, and a grant from the state, I believe, as well. So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to push, what kind of a time frame are you guys thinking to, to kind of move further and to, to be ready to come back to council with more information? I would say within 90 days we'll okay. have some other ideas that we can present. Okay, great. And by the way, Tim, I did check. It was Clearfield was the uh, the company that um, when I was in Minnesota for the conference. Oh, the one we the, couldn't remember when we were on yes, the conference. Mm -hmm. right. So. Okay. And I would just like to take the, uh, this opportunity to thank Springsnet and the village managers, fiber advisory boards, it's the same group of gentlemen. They've worked really hard on this. They've put a lot of, of sweat equity into this, and I appreciate what you're trying to do for the village. We're going to continue our efforts. We just need thanks. to find the right way. Yep, thanks. And yeah, thanks, Scott. Thanks to all of you. Um, we look forward to hearing from you again. Um, <laughs> I, I assume we. Um, do not have an HRC annual report, Mary Apparently we do not. Okay. I've been in communication with Steve and thought he was going to be here and he's not. So um, moving on to old business, the housing needs and, assessment. And Liz Voigt, I anticipate her to be here at 745, which is... So, okay, so let's, um, let's do the council goals review. And I don't even know if, if this was intended to be on this agenda. I wanted to put it on just because it was actually pretty easy to just go ahead. I mean, it is, it is mid-year, so, um, or a little bit past mid-year. I don't want it to go too much farther. So you can see my, my um, uh, notations, uh, my colored, my colorful notations. And um, some things, it seemed obviously that the specific activities in the, the middle column was easier to address there. Some of the other things are a little bit more general, like the developed strategy for fiscal sustainability. Those uh, particular activities are a little bit more general. So, um, you know, we can we can bring it back. It would probably be a good idea to bring it back to a meeting where Judith um, will be in attendance. Um, just to maybe get some feedback on what everybody's thinking at this point as far as um, the notations, how things are going, um, and any changes you might want to see in this format. Um, I did notice on the glass farm, I think it would be good to include the wetlands um, reconstruction. And that should be completed by the end of... In, as, as that, one of the activities? One six, yes. As, yes, as mm -hmm. one of that. Okay. And uh, then Tecumseh Land Trust could be listed also as a resource. <coughs> and if we, do, we, do we want to review the, the entire document or do we want to just maybe save that for um, when Judith comes back? Let's save so we don't have okay. to do it twice. Right, okay. I'm okay with saving. I do want to mention though um, with the dig once policy, you know, while while we have talked about that this is kind of our practice, we have not formalized that yet. So I'll make that green? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I think it would be an easy thing to do. So we'll add the wetlands reconstruction. Um, and then you said, so it would be over in this last category. We'll add TLT. Okay. Okay, sounds so we'll bring that back. I don't know if we'll do it for the August meeting or September, the first meeting in September. We can talk about that during agenda planning. So I see our guest is here. has arrived. Yeah. So Marianne, why don't you yeah. introduce her, please? Yeah. Okay. Um, Liz, would you come up here? So um, Liz Voigt has graciously agreed <laughs> to, uh, to talk with us about housing needs assessment. Uh, which we're currently working on. Liz and her husband moved. To, when did you move here? Like this fall, October. <laughs> a few, several months ago, planning on settling down. And her husband's. Did he grow up here? No, his father grew up there. His father. Um, and then he got another job that he couldn't refuse. So she's in the middle of packing. And um, <laughs> but she graciously agreed to come. So Liz has been a consultant on housing and fair housing issues. She was a special assistant to the general counsel of HUD. 
and previous to that she was with uh, Public Advocates Inc. in San Francisco. So she, more than I'm sure anyone else in this village, <laughs> probably in Greene County, uh, knows about housing and housing issues. So given that we're still thinking about what we, what is a housing needs assessment, what do we want in it, it seemed like a really opportune time to have Liz come and give her thoughts on this. So sure. take it away. So, good evening. <laughs> um, uh, in addition to being a resident of Yellow Springs, I'm also on the board of Yellow Springs Home Inc. Um, so I, um, as Councilmember McQueen said, I am my my background is in housing with a particular focus on fair housing, and a lot of that work is in bigger cities. But I have seen a fair amount of um, housing planning related activities um, from the federal perspective and also from the local perspective and so she asked me to come and share some thoughts so I've prepared some comments but I'm also just happy to answer questions to the best of my ability um, but I did have some particular recommendations as you sort of look forward to the upcoming housing needs assessment um, and the first thing I'll start with is the big takeaway from my experience is to make sure that the process isn't a paper exercise, which I'm sure is not your goal, but way too many places spend precious public resources on a process that results in a report that sits on a shelf. Um, and so, but I think there are ways to avoid that. I think it's an important thing to really understand the needs before you take action. Um, and there are lots of ways to do that in a way that can be a really meaningful process. So I have a few particular recommendations um, to that end. Um, so the first relates to the data analysis, which is sort of the core place to start with a needs assessment, right? There's lots of ideas floating in the air, but to really ground a needs assessment in reality, you need to start with data. And so. Um, this will obviously depend what exactly what kind of data you or a consultant that you hire looks at will depend on the goals and the direction you give them. But generally, um, the, a, day, a needs assessment or a housing policy planning process will look at housing stock and housing costs, population demographics, including race and income, segregation patterns, um, imbalances between housing costs and income, imbalances between housing supply and demand, available land for development, among many other things. And we can talk more about some of those. And um, I'm not an expert in the data piece, but happy to talk more about that. So the, there are two things I want to say about the data that are sort of maybe not obvious. Um, the first is to make sure the data, for the data analysis to be meaningful, I strongly encourage you to look at trends over time and not just a point in time picture of the housing stock and needs. So looking at several decades, and you're, this is all census data, the vast majority of what you'd look at is census data, so it's just as easily available for the last 40 years as it is for the last census. And so to look at trends over time, over several decades, will help you understand what's been happening around housing availability and affordability and how that's impacted who lives in the village, who can't live in the village, the kind of financial pressures residents are under, um, and how life has been changing. And then having that backwards look helps you understand the trajectory you're on. Um, so you can't really make plans for the future without understanding how housing has impacted the trajectory that the village is on. Um, and this, I think that this idea of trends over time and the changes that have been happening because of housing is especially important for the values of inclusion and diversity that I know that the village holds dear. And that'll be a common theme in the points that I make because that's my background and I know that's an important point for the village and for your goals. Um, so the second um, recommendation I make around the data analysis is to not artificially look at the data, to, to not artificially limit the boundaries to the village boundaries. Um, so of course you're doing a plan for the village and you're the decision makers for the village, but fair housing planning guidelines and progressive places that want to be thoughtful about how they think about their housing policies include in their assessments a look at the region. So in here, I think a regional look would include some data, some sense of how the village compares to the Dayton Springfield metro area. Um, so this will understand, it will help you understand what's happening with people who work here but can't afford to live in the village or families who've left because they no longer can afford to stay. Just the realities of the community is that you're situated in the larger housing and job market. Um, I don't want to say, I know the village is small, Miriam <laughs> says that, you know, the resources are constrained, so I'm not suggesting a very expensive process or suggesting a plan that you should be planning for the full, the region's housing needs by any means, but 
when you have a sense of the um, housing costs in the region compared to the village, the demographics of the region compared to the village, that will help you paint a real picture of what's going on in the housing market and what's needed. Um, and this is especially important under fair housing law. Are there organizations, I mean, other government organizations that would be cooperative with us in that? So, I mean, the county is, so, so there are other governmental entities in the area that have obligations to HUD to look at some of these pieces that you don't have as a smaller village, but so the county has obligations to conduct an assessment of fair housing, the city of Dayton does, and then connect that, and I know, so I know the HUD planning processes best, I'm not as familiar with the Ohio plan, and Emily is here from Homing, so she can maybe answer some of those pieces, but um, yeah, so some of that countywide data should already be available for Green County through their HUD required assessments. So that will be helpful. And this too is, you know, sort of a basic sense of demographics and housing costs um, is, is all census data as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're hiring a consultant, you're just asking essentially for the sort of denominator in the comparisons to be compared to the region for some of this. And actually, Marianne, in Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission has an amazing yeah. database of demographics that they've put together, um, and that's a eight county, right, mm -hmm. right, region. Yeah. So does HUD have some sort of guidelines about doing this, or? So there are two things that. Um, jurisdictions that directly receive money from HUD, so counties and large cities generally. Um, so one is called an assessment of fair housing, which will include a lot of what I'm talking about in terms of trends over time and regional data and a particular look at segregation patterns, right? Racial segregation patterns, that's what the Fair Housing Act is focused on. Um, so there's actually a new set of guidelines that came out of HUD in 2015. I don't think anyone in the immediate area has conducted their assessment under these new guidelines, but there are guidelines, and I'm happy to share links to those kinds of things. It's pretty onerous. Um, I mean, it's not un unrealistic for a large city, but it's a, it's a big undertaking, but it has really, I think it would be very helpful direction to give a consultant about some of the core pieces, and I think there are lots of places that are starting to do these analyses before they're even required because they want to be thoughtful um, about, about the fair housing issues in their community. So that's one, and then the other HUD guideline is, so the assessment of fair housing, which is something I'm going to talk about, is now linked to action, right? So you just don't want to just look at this data and say, wow, now we have a better understanding of our community, which is great, but like, what's the step after that? How do you link it to action? So in the HUD set of requirements, it links to what's called the consolidated plan, which is the five-year plan for how you're going to spend all your housing dollars or your federal dollars that relate to housing. So those are similar requirements that will apply to the county and to large cities in the area. Um, I think you could actually be a more tailored in the action component than the consolidated plan, which is like a very um, lengthy document, pretty focused on federal funding. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that if, um, if you want me to, to continue. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, so those are sort of the two big points I would make about the data analysis. I'm going to come back to some ideas about how to get resources to be more specific, like in an RFP or <coughs> a consultant. Um, but the next thing I want to make sure to highlight is that you don't want to just look at data, right? Like this needs to be grounded in community and the community's perspective on the needs and the goals that you're setting based on those needs. And so my next recommendation relates to meaningful community engagement. Um, and this means making sure that you're not just talking to the usual players and that you're not just having a single noticed meeting and expecting people to come when they're putting their kids to bed and <laughs> right which is of course how government works but that like you that that you go out to the community and engage people where they are and speak to them in a language that makes sense and that you're engaging a diverse set of community constituents in doing that and i think one of the exciting things about yellow, yellow springs is that you have so many community organizations that already have members and meetings and you can go directly to them um, and you can actually engage them to be your partners in this process. You could have a task force of a handful of community groups that represent diverse constituents of the community to collect information um, about their housing needs and with some specific questions that, that are part of the analysis process. Um, the other thing I would recommend in addition to, to being 
being collaborative and thinking outside the box on who you're speaking to in the community is that the community engagement is iterative. So sort of too often we have a fully drafted report and you have a slideshow like this <laughs> and these wonderful people are here um, and, and people have to react in real time in public comment, right? And this stuff is hard and your personal, your personal familial situation fits into that data mapping, I'm not sure. But so a process that says, you know, there's a chance to see the first set of data and digest it a little, come back to a next conversation, maybe in small groups and with some community volunteers, I think you could do that in a way that isn't extremely expensive but is really meaningful. Um, so I, I would really recommend that you think about the community organizations as resources to be your partners in this process um, as actually helping to staff that community engagement. Again, I'll just note that in many places the consultant who's hired to do the data analysis is often not the best match for the community engagement. So using people who are already here, bigger progressive cities actually resource their community-based organizations to be the lead on community engagement and then work with that consultant or some kind of central coordinator so that it's organized. Um, I'll just say one other thing about Yellow Springs is that it's small, right, and these conversations are I've learned in <laughs> my short time here, like go back to like, well, my mom's experience, right? Like there's generations, there's actually an opportunity to not just hear from people, but to facilitate a dialogue on this. And that's not easy, but I think it's really possible here, an exciting opportunity given the size and the commitment of the community. Um, so I'll, I'll just, I know I'm a little bit short on time, but um, the last piece I want to talk about is this importance of linking what you've learned from the data analysis and the community engagement about needs and goals to action. Um, and I encourage you to think about the action component coming out of this needs to be beyond a single site. Because I think what much too often, you, you can't, a single development site can't possibly serve all the needs and goals that the needs assessment is going to <coughs> reveal. Um, and so you could think of this process as actually helping you set that decision making of what kind of community do we want to be and how are we going to get there over years of policy decision making that you're going to be and now you have the, the, the information to be thoughtful about that process. And of course you're not, this isn't just the only piece of information, you've done other processes and so you're actually building on previous knowledge. So if I have a minute, I just want to say a little bit about the kinds of action you might want to consider moving forward. Um, so obviously it's going to depend on what your needs assessment reveals. Um, but local governments have many tools that impact housing availability, affordability, location, condition. Um, so I just want to give a few examples of the kinds of things you might want to think about. Um, so there might, it might come out of the process that you want to increase the overall supply of housing in the market, right? Like there could be a need that we have people who are looking for homes who could afford a market rate home in the village, but can't find one. Um, and you have tools in your toolbox about increasing the overall supply. We could talk a little bit more about those. Um, but I think it's, un and, and generally increasing the overall supply will bring down costs a little in the middle, but just increasing the supply is not going to satisfy a need if the assessment shows it for moderate and low income homeowners and so, I mean residents. And so you'll need strategies that help create dedicated affordable housing. Um, so these will have to come out of your process and your decision making process, but many places have programs for affordable housing trust funds, for donating land for affordable housing, for placing fees on commercial development for affordable housing, um, for proactively identifying and rezoning sites for affordable housing, and many others. So there are lots of tools in your toolbox. And then I just want to note that often there's, there are comments that, that low and moderate income um, homes don't meet the lowest income families, and that's often the case. Um, and the, but you have strategies to reach the lowest income families too, if that's something the needs assessment reveals. And um, I particularly think about um, ways to protect families that have Section 8 vouchers who may want to live in the village. So some jurisdictions will add additional <coughs> fair housing protection to prohibit discrimination on the basis of what's called source of income or voucher holders. So in Yellow Springs, for instance, you've added an additional anti-discrimination provision for the LGBTQ community. And so you could do something like this to protect voucher holders so they don't face discrimination in the rental market. Um, I'll just note on this, um, 
as you think about the policy component, the action plan that comes from the needs assessment, you may carry through a community task force. So if you have a group of diverse community groups that are part of engaging the community on, set, on understanding the needs and setting the goals, you could also engage them on thinking about policy recommendations and have them do some of the work of drawing on outside resources for coming up with policy solutions. Um, and just on that note of coming up with policy solutions and doing all of this work, there are, there are a few resources I just want to mention um, to you. So there are some, there's some written materials like the HUD guidelines, which I'm happy to share links to, and there's a few links to um, translations of them into English because they're pretty dense. Um, but there are obviously many talented nonprofit and for-profit consultants. I just want to note that there's a at Case Western, there's a national initiative on mixed income housing, and they come to mind because they're based here in Ohio, and they may be the kind of academic and nonprofit institution that may be interested in bidding on an RFP that would do a really strong job. Um, and I'm also excited to share that I have colleagues at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. It's a national civil rights organization. They specialize, the lawyers I work with specialize in fair housing and community development. And they have just coincidentally decided to focus in on Southwest Ohio to provide support around fair housing issues. They're in different parts of the country. And so they would be available to provide some pro bono assistance to the council or to your consultant around, especially around the data analysis components that have fair housing implications. So um, I look forward to connecting you however that um, makes the most sense. So those were my thoughts. I wasn't keeping time, I'm sorry. No, um, I, but happy to answer any questions. Or <clears throat> Well, I have a question. How, how much in, within the RFP should we put out our values or the kind of community we feel we want to be? I mean, we do have values and we know that we yeah. value diversity, both income and ethnic racially. Uh, we don't want to just be a bedroom community. I mean, there's, we value sustainable development, I mean, and environmentally friendly. Should things like that be, does that have a place in the RFP to help yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the more agreement you have about what this is going into it, the better it is to give that guidance up front. And I think it would actually encourage some play. So for instance, the Case Western Center might be more interested because of those values, right? They're interested in helping to build mixed income communities. They're interested in being part of housing solutions that have racial justice outcomes. And so they're going to be more interested in this than a small community that says, oh, we need some data analysis to build more housing at market rate, and that's all we care about. So you might actually get a different pool of, of um, responses. So I'm also thinking that um, there, it, it would, uh, personally, I think it would be great if we'd have some development where the houses were very environmentally friendly mm -hmm. and were built the really rigorous uh, standards in terms of uh, energy use. And if we had data that supports there's an interest in whatever it is that we say, I'm assuming that that would help a developer go, oh, this isn't my traditional development, but it seems like there's interest, so I go for it. it is that, yeah. can you speak to that? Well, I think, um, there are sort of a few things, right? I think so one thing is putting out, being clear to the in the RFP about the stages of analysis you're looking for, right? Like a housing needs assessment suggests a pretty step back assessment of housing stock, you know, kind of where are we and as I was suggesting, where have we gone and where are we going and how is housing part of the kind of community we want to be, which I think is a really helpful first step. I think if you're then hoping that consultant will help with the action plan, which I would encourage you to do um, either in a phased RFP or in one, then you could make those kinds of um, value statements on the kinds of policy recommendations you want. I think the other thing is you want to test that theory, right? So what are the trade-offs? Like, I think it's more expensive to build. So what does that mean for overall housing costs? How do we balance our interest in environmental sustainability with our interest in affordability and diversity? And these are the kinds of things that when you have a comprehensive plan, then you can do them all. And if you have a single site, you probably can't do everything on a single site. So that's why it's important to put out, so sort of come to a clear sense of the whole picture of the needs and goals, and then all of the strategies you need. And so that you as decision makers and the community engaging understand those trade-offs you're making. Like we say, 
we want, an urban growth boundary is something that in a lot of places, right? We want to stay small. We want to be clear about our environmental impact. That brings up costs. And that maybe is a perfectly you know, valid decision to make as a community, but let's understand that we're doing that. And what does that mean for the trade-offs of who can live here? And I have, I'm not making a value judgment on that. I, they're, you know, but you're making that decision. And so the whole idea of this is that you have full information to make the full set of decisions and you're engaging in the community in a transparent way about those decisions and it helps you sort of see a, a full picture. So we made that decision a long time ago. Right. So right. Right. <laughs> right. It exists. It is. Right. I mean that's the way but it is. And then sort of what do we do with that, right? And that's a really mm -hmm. important component of the of the village. And so um, that's but that's the kind of thing that this gives you the chance to do to understand now what does that mean for other things along with lots of other cost implications of other other factors. So one piece that resonates with me is, is what you talked about with the collaborative mm -hmm. aspect with nonprofits. Uh, I think that's a great suggestion. Um, is your experience that working with like a Case Western kind of outfit, outfit would uh, be easier to facilitate that? So I, so I don't know the Case Western folks like as well as I know the Lawyers Committee in terms of their working style, so it's something that I more note because of their reputation nationally in the policy solutions around mixed income communities. I don't know their work style as well. The Lawyers Committee actually has worked quite a bit on community engagement where they've been working with the city or a county or a town that's required to do a fair housing assessment and they need to engage with the community and lawyers committee has helped with some of those processes. So they would definitely have thoughts on that. I can't volunteer them to like be on the ground here as a central coordinator by any means, but um, they would have some experience. I think you actually have some experienced organizers in the community. So you might think about the resources here um, so that you have some pairing of like community grounded a table of diverse folks with some kind of coordination that's local and then that outside expertise on the housing matters likely through your consultant or maybe it's a second phase of a consultant depending on who you pick from the RFP. Um, but usually there's a local organization that would take the lead on a coalition table like that. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we've got Coupa, we've got Wright State. Um, Coupa, they might they might have something that would be helpful. Um, is, is it your experience that out of these kinds of studies and this kind of work, that that developers will come to the table and and that this this work is basically preparing a roadmap for developers to be interested in a community? Yeah. What developers want to know is is um, predictability, right? Like they want to know the rules of the game and then how they can make money or fulfill their mission depending on if they're a for-profit or a mission-driven nonprofit, right? So I think definitely, I mean, in a lot of communities, it's only the developers at the table, which is why I made such a strong um, point about community engagement, which is obviously I know your interest already and just the values of the village. But yeah, I think, I think you could expect that. I don't know the community as well. I don't know, Emily, if you have anything to add, but that would that would be my expectation. Yeah, I'm personally looking that. for a mix of developers. Yeah. I'm looking for market rate and um, folks like Home Inc. Yeah. To, to, you know, kind of um, to yeah. be attracted to Yellow Springs. And I think it'll be great to hear from developers for for more. If you're if one, as I said, like one of the pieces of the goals could be more market rate development, right? That's what you want to see in the village is more homes. Um, bringing developers to the table and help in figuring out essentially how do you bring, likely what they want to know is how, how can we make it less expensive to develop here. We'll develop more if it's less mm -hmm. expensive to develop here, right? Like that's sort of their basic. And so then you'll have decisions to make if they say what we want to build is multifamily housing. We want <coughs> denser housing that's cheaper to build. That's could be something you hear and then you take that into consideration but I think it's important to hear that perspective. So did I understand from Mary Ann that you're actually going to be leaving us? On Thursday. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but I, I, I'm certainly committed to supporting Home Inc. in whatever role makes sense and the village. So I will, and I have promised Lawyers Committee who I <laughs> convinced to do this, that I would help to be a link. So, you know, and yeah, as, as um, Mary Ann said, the Yellow Springs has a family tie for us. So, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you sure. for coming. Thank, thank you. you for this great information. Sure, nice yeah. to meet we you. See and you sorry to see you go. Any, yeah. Yeah, yeah. any other questions or comments? Anything to add? Okay. Great. Thank yeah. you so much. Sure. Good luck. Thank you. Your, sure. next, thank you. Uh, your next home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um,
why don't we go ahead and go ahead and do your um, your report on the uh, complete streets proposal. Yeah. I, I yeah, noticed I that. Did you cut? Yeah. Steve? Well, okay. Uh, complete streets. Um, so uh, the document that I provided for the packet highlights our council goal um, related to really active transportation and um, some pretty interesting dots have been connected um, as, as Patty knows and I'm not sure that all council are aware. Um, the uh, technical assistance grant that the uh, Active Transportation Committee applied for on behalf of the village was, uh, we got it. And um, so basically we have a consultant from ODOT, uh, Ohio Department of Transportation, to help us walk through the Active Transportation planning process. Um, just kind of to remind folks, a lot of this was tied to work we've done related to sidewalks and you know some of the other things that we want to make sure you know make us uh, you know a welcoming community uh, in terms of getting around. And um, the complete streets policy, uh, I see it as a way to sort of tee up the planning process. Um, MVRPC, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission, um, since we are a member, offers uh, this training uh, for free. And uh, we can basically uh, uh, outline what we think is most important. So I've put together a proposal of what I think could happen, and I also included a, uh, a template for an agenda based on a scoping meeting that Marianne and I had with uh, some village staff. Um, so the first step that I'm recommending is that we have a half day uh, complete streets workshop, and this is going to be uh, primarily for staff, for council members. I would encourage all council members to attend. I think of it kind of like a working session to answer a lot of our questions. And um, then I also mentioned other stakeholders, so I know uh, Active Transportation Committee folks are planning to attend some of them. We've talked about business owners, uh, and uh, I, I would welcome any thoughts about who we should invite. There's not a limit on size. It will be a, a publicly announced meeting, so it is open to the public. Um, but, uh, but the target will really be on laying all the groundwork for what we need to do for a policy. Um, one thing I thought we could discuss is this idea of having a community forum um, to talk about what a complete streets policy uh, would look like for Yellow Springs. Um, for every municipality it's different, uh, but I guess I'd like feedback about whether council thinks that's a good idea to pursue. Um, and then following that, uh, forming a, a policy working group. So this would be a subcommittee, uh, a few staff members, a few council members, some people from the Active Transportation Committee that want to actually work on drafting out that complete streets policy uh, based on everything we've talked about and the feedback that we've gotten. And then we bring a recommendation to council. Um, so. I'm hoping that this can happen relatively soon um, because, you know, given the fact that we got that grant, I think it would be nice to go through this process and then get that consultant uh, into the mix to start uh, tackling some of these problems like, you know, what can we do about our sidewalks. So that's the uh, overall proposal. Any questions, thoughts? What would you like from council at this point? Um, I guess two things. One is, uh, is August 24th an okay date for the half day workshop? And secondly, do we want to pursue a community forum? Can we decide that the community forum piece? I mean, that I would assume that that's going to be when that would be. I'd like it to happen. Uh, I'd like it all to happen pretty, uh, you know, pretty connected in time um, because I think we could finish this goal by 2017 if we're, you know, sort of following a plan for that. Um, and I, I do think if we did do the community forum, it would be with the idea that that would give us direction that would help with the, uh, um, the active transportation plan for the village. Um, you know, I, I, I will point out we haven't had 
that much success uh, with attendance for community forums. Um, so <laughs> that is my caveat. Uh, but you know, it, it's something that MVRPC is willing to help facilitate. I think we really need to engage the schools and we really need to engage, it would be good to engage the township, the fire department. So, you know, I'm thinking about this joint meeting that we're talking about, although is that being talked about after the first of the year? Is that potentially? Yeah, no. Okay, okay, so forget mm -hmm. that. Um, but still, we should invite those invite, folks. Right. Invite. Yep. So, Brian, what are you thinking? Are you thinking like right after Labor Day or before the half-day workshop? The community piece? Yeah. Um, I think it would be better for it to happen after the workshop, mm -hmm. but, you know, but soon after. Um, and, you know, this, the idea here would really be um, letting people know what complete streets means and then giving a lot of opportunity for feedback from uh, community members. I mean, I think that, you know, maybe, so you're thinking maybe September, mid to end of September yep. for that? Because I'd like to, I mean, I, I, I want to take advantage of that grant, right. um, you know, as, as and soon what's as possible. And what's the situation when, has anybody spoken with them? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have confirmed that we are accepting that. And, and when is, when are they talking about starting? I think it's, it's up to us. So. Yeah, they haven't really, what they're trying to do is um, find out how many communities uh, want to take advantage of the consultant and then they're going to hire the consultant as a, um, like a group package. Everyone will use the same consultant. Okay. Um, right. So they're trying right now to figure out who wants to participate in that as a, you know, as a group and then they'll let that that RFP. So we've got a little bit of time to do this, but probably not a huge. Although amount. it would be good, it seems, if we're if we're in there in the beginning as expressing interest and being being on board, that um, maybe we would be at the head of the class to yep. get this consultant instead of waiting, right. um, being at the end of the the right. end. Um, so that would be encouraging. And uh, I was just actually on the active transportation team call. So um, so this funding comes from uh, ODOT and the Ohio Department of Health, and uh, we were one of seven communities in Ohio to uh, receive a technical assistance grant. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. So, I mean, I think at this point, let's, let's definitely focus on, on August 24th because that's what staff needs to schedule. That's what council, we all need to schedule that. Um, I mean, let's, let's focus on that and mm -hmm. decide if that's doable. The staff, is, staff is already on board. Okay. Um, all, all of my staff has already responded. And I so, see down here you've got, I mean, and we'll, what we talked about, because I was at the active transportation meeting, <laughs> what we talked about is, is, you know, we can just convene a council meeting and it, mm -hmm. for all, all council members can be there. We'll just convene a council meeting and um, go from there. All right. And, uh, and I have, you know, been working with MVRPC on this agenda and they've kind of helped talk about what makes sense based on what our goals are. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, modules that they have for sort of the engineering geeks. So, uh, so if our staff does want to go deeper, they have that information as well. So, council, are we? Yep. Is this, would this be in the evening then? No. No. Eight thirty a.m. to one p.m. Okay. Yeah, and, and part of that is we will do a walking audit. Um, I'm recommending three groups. Um, one group that will hit uh, West South College, which has been a target, and obviously we've done some improvements there with the Sharrows. Uh, Dayton Street has been proposed. And actually, I think a third group should check out Yellow Springs Fairfield, especially with, you know, the, uh, the safe routes to school coming in and, and seeing, you know, what else we can do there. But We'll need some safety vests for that one, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess I would, I would, my preference would be downtown, but yeah, um, we could do that too. We can, we can figure that out. Yeah. So we'll, we'll agree that um, August twenty fourth, eight thirty to one, um, per the agenda that Brian has 
um, proposed and then maybe independently you and the active transportation group can start to look at a forum would MVRPC be involved in that I assume they would be and mm -hmm. you know maybe kind of tentatively start to put that together okay Okay. Do we All need? Right. I don't think we need a motion. This is yeah. This is yeah. good. Yeah, I, I noticed that Steve McQueen has come. I know. I know. We. I wanted to get finished <laughs> with old business. We'll move back to special reports and get the HRC annual report. Steve, come on up. <clears throat> Hello, Dr. State. My name is Steve McQueen. I am now treasurer of the HRC Human Relations Commission. <laughs> I first want to apologize for the lateness of this report. Um, I, long story short, <laughs> there's been a lot of uh, personal things between illnesses, babies, weddings, uh, and so weddings. Things finally back on. Yeah, weddings. Uh, yes, I get <laughs> as recently. in your wedding. As in my wedding, <laughs> right? Um, plus, we also just had a um, change in all of our um, ah, positions that are held. Uh, so, the, once again, that's why I'm announcing myself as treasurer, no longer secretary. Uh, and so we are catch, playing catch up at the moment. But really, um, basically, once because once we found out that we're really not bidding for a certain amount of money any longer, um, and that this is more of like this is what we're doing and this is what we have planned and what we have been doing, um, this is really just going to be a report of last year we were able to do um, a full 14 or uh, support 14 different events and or month-long things we uh, support a lot and uh, it's a lot of them are common like our, our girls boys night out um, our block parties which we do annually um, and why is pride is another one and also for the third year in a row we've done the eighth grade trip in which we've been able to sponsor um, some of the students um, who haven't been able to fully afford we've been able to work that out with teachers and, and uh, as well as principal uh, for the middle school um, Kwanzaa is another one we do every year uh, but last year we were able to add the ninja self-defense and empowerment program uh, which was our second year of doing that um, but this year we started the uh, Month of Consent series, which was for the month of um, women uh, empowerment and it's like a domestic abuse sort of uh, awareness month. Uh, we wanted to contribute to that. Um, of course, some of these will sound outdated, like we had some things with Chief Hill, but we did also social support for a new chief, which we wanted to make sure that uh, we spoke on and then so that was last year and also we ended the year with the indigenous people's day resolution which we were really proud to bring to uh, council and that is still being worked on to today um, we've also done some really unique events something called the obsidian launch for call and response which was a program done by a former Antioch professor who came back this year and we sponsored another event as called something different um, but basically it was a call and response program that uh, was done in a couple of other places but it ended up making it to a magazine and the magazine came all the way to Yellow Springs to Antioch and was able to um, basically do different projects some coming out of Kentucky some coming out of Nevada <clears throat> other places she's traveled um, but we have magazines and there's some at the library 365 project also has a copy the library has a copy um, and so we were able to sponsor things like that so we're very proud of what we've been able to do and we are still working on more of course our black parties are coming up again and we already have uh, interest in that um, of course our eighth grade uh, project which we were still working on and once in a while we are still getting some brand new ideas and we're always there to listen and help with the community and, and there are still some ideas floating around and we're really happy that we can contribute and we're really hoping that you will help us be able to contribute to the community 
And so, if there are any questions. I just wanted to uh, talk about a project. Um, the Senior Center has received a grant um, to do a dementia-friendly dementia Yellow Springs project. Mm -hmm. And I did mention um, that they should talk to HRC and, and maybe get some work with youth just to, just to you know, some, some things that could be brought to um, Village Council. Also, so just so. something, just something to, to look for in 2000. 17, 18. And, and so I am meeting to, with them tomorrow, okay. so I can reiterate. If you could pass along the proposal, we will gladly work with them. And we've had to do that a couple of times where proposals come in and we work with people and we, we can tell them what they can do and what we can do. Great. Absolutely. Steve, when will the block parties, when are people so suggesting? the block parties, the, the, we, uh, actually the beginning of August is when you can apply for block parties and once you apply you will be given a, um, a bit of a stipend to help that block uh, promote this party mm -hmm. and however you're going to do it and um, the parties themselves are usually the last half of April and the first half of September. Uh, we don't necessarily have an end date, but that's usually about the time because then school begins and we start to get pretty busy here again. So we would like for that time period, but the beginning of August, we're going to have things in the paper for people to know where to apply for the stipends for your block party. Right, and and just to make sure they are coming to our office, I think now. Correct. Well, we're just going right. to right. We're just going to let you know where you can do this. Right. Yeah. So the village is facilitating them like last year. The yes, village is it'll facilitating still be. them. Yeah. Yes. Um, because that way we can make sure that we that uh, Jason's crew gets the barricades out if they need to close a road. We can. We have to get the gift certificates from Tom so that they can have <clears> that. We distribute Chrissy's paperwork for mm -hmm. Know Your Neighbor, right. which is another HRC program. So we do all of that. It was just easier to just do it. HRC promotes it, the village does the actual right. right. <laughs> Great. Um, well, I want to say uh, I appreciate the work that you guys continue to do. Um, there are two things on my mind. Um, one of them is uh, we don't see minutes that often, and um, these great projects would be great, you know, to sort of regularly let the community know that, you know, this is intentional spending to you know deliver on our village values you know so I, I think that would be nice to kind of get the sort of rationale for why we're you know supporting these things on a regular basis mm -hmm. and the other thing I mentioned a couple times is uh, I guess our, our you know our new standard now is to uh, apply for a budget um, you know for all commissions and um, I think for you guys in particular it's easy because as you said you do the same activities in a lot of ways every year, um, so I would I would love for you guys to uh, to do like that full proposal. We can act gladly. Uh, real simple. Way. I mean, you, you know, know, if you look at I know I shared with you guys what the Arts and Culture Commission did. You know, just a simple sort of you know, here's what we're doing for education. Here's what we're doing for community development. Um, because that also helps us to continue to have the community support for this kind of uh, work. Well, simple response to that, we have a new secretary who is a teacher who's going to be a lot better about that than I previously was a secretary. Good with notes, but the, uh, the other part, we're, we're going to definitely work that out. Cool. And so she knows, and so we're, we're definitely going to make sure that that is definitely done. And then now being treasurer, I should be able to definitely work that out on my own, which I'm very excited to do. Great. And so um, now that you have the report, what I'll do is just have a little something formal but simple of this is what's been done, this is what we'd like, but we do understand whatever is given we'll definitely use to our best ability. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. And thanks to the rest of HRC. Thank you very much. Wait, and so yeah, so we should hear who who's uh, who are the officers now for the. So HRC. Nick is still the chair, and now Chrissy Cruz is co-chair. I am treasurer. Steve McQueen is treasurer in case the name needs to be there, and Jessica Thomas is now secretary of HRC, um, and Kate um, 
gave up for personal health reasons her position as co-chair. So now, Chrissy. Mm. But she's still part of the commission? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's why I wanted to make sure you knew that Kay Good. hasn't left. She just is now just a member. Um, and Chrissy has gone to that spot. I took Chrissy's spot. Jessica is taking my position. Great. Great. All right. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I will say we did lose an alternate. We lost our yes, Scott. We, and we will be, yeah, that's the only so, other thing um, is we will, there will be a couple of things in the paper about positions opening, um, mainly with the alternate position. And there are some uh, people towards, there are some positions, or not positions, but uh, the probability of a position, depending on whether people reapply or not, as well. So just look forward to maybe that happening, I believe it's November. Is, um, is Corey still? It's Corey and Nick came on at the same time. Nick has definitely talked more about remaining, but Corey is still iffy. So if you do notice something, we'll, we'll know before then. We've already talked with Corey about making sure we have plenty of time so that we can actually apply properly and make sure you guys accept before we give any positions to anyone. But that would be it. And the alternate as well, who did resign. All right. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next is a tap fee discussion. We had uh, quite a, uh, an extensive um, bit of information in our packet um, that was prepared by staff. I see uh, they're all here. Um, I will turn it over to Patty to start the discussion. Okay. Um, as was noted in a brief that I prepared um, when there was discussion about waiving the home ink, um, the home ink taps, um, I noted that it actually does cost us more for a water tap than we actually charge people. It costs us more in um, equipment and the brass and the meter that we put into the pit and in addition to that we install it. Um, so at that point council had asked if we could bring a comparison um, and further information on tap fees and make suggestions as to what we thought they should be. So staff had been working on this previously so we all um, we actually had a lot of the information. We um, confirmed that the information was still valid and so you see there a spreadsheet that has tap fees from several other communities and the, the spreadsheet notes the, the population of those com communities um, and what they charge for each water, uh, water tap, sewer inspection and capacity and if they have electric what they charge for that because those are the three um, utilities that we we generally um, oversee. They're a little bit different because we actually provide the meter and equipment and install water and electric, but on sewer, um, Jason does inspection and then we have capacity on that because we're selling the capacity in the system. We, we can't sell it to anybody else, can't use it for anybody else. But there's typically not equipment for sewer? There is not equipment for sewer. Because our general assumption is what you use for water is what you put back into the system or? What, yes, the general assumption is that your sewer bill is calculated off of your water read, mm -hmm. just like your water bill is, unless there is a reason that it shouldn't be. For instance, um, uh, we have one business that has, um, that uses more water than they put back into the system. They use the water in their process and therefore they have an actual separate meter right. Right. Which is what we actually talked about at the last meeting right. um, with the sewer. Um, right. We also, sewer. Um, uh, as you talked about at the last meeting, have an allowance for um, summer watering and pressure washing your house and that kind of thing, which can also affect your sewer. But in general, at a residence or a business, your sewer bill is calculated off of the same read that your water bill is calculated on because it's assumed that what you're you taking out of the system you're putting back in it has to go be treated at the water at the wastewater treatment plant mm -hmm. um, but no as far as <coughs> sewer installation we do not provide any parts or anything like that jason inspects them he goes out and physically inspects them and then we have the capacity um, when we're talking about water 
we provide the meter and all the brass fittings and all of the connections in there and our crews install them and the same with the electric we provide the meter and all the connections and our crew installs them so could you go through each one could you go through water sewer and electric briefly and maybe it would be better for the for the superintendents to do it and describe when a new meter you know because there there's something in here about um, the customer takes it from the residence to the street so just right. talk about what exactly in in a new um, service right. is the customer's responsibility and and Johnny can speak to the water the electric and then Jason um, will need to speak to the sewer on the water we actually <coughs> they do all the digging uh, all the way to the main they dig around the main uh, then the crew actually we actually tap the main and we provide the uh, corp stop and then we take about 10 foot of copper all the way to a brass curb stop and then we bring up one tail for them to be able to hook onto. Then we provide them with a meter bar, two shutoffs, an expansion, a yoke, and a meter. That's the only thing we provide on the water. But we actually do all the manual tapping. So if you give them the, the equipment, does their plumber then install that? They or? install the yoke, everything that goes in the meter pit the plumber installs except for the meter and then but we install you, but it. we're taking we only village crew actually touch our main is Correct. that correct absolutely mm -hmm. yes and then, unless unless <laughs> it is over two inch if it is over two inch we contract it out but you okay. inspect everything we correct? inspect it all we're on site when every tap happens okay and um you had and I was just going to say, so uh, I seem to remember the number was like 450 for that equipment cost. Actually, I got an updated cost, and that is what Patty put in the packet. Okay. Um, the only uh, alternative I had, because we've got so many different meter pit designs out there, that if we wanted to go to a standard meter pit, that there was an additional cost that we could add to that. And it's like another $150. Mm -hmm. But that's if we decided to do that, then we would actually provide them everything that they need for their meter. We actually mark the location, they do the digging. Now, if somebody's moving one from the basement outside, then what we do is, is we would either shut it off at the curb stop and then put the meter in, but we still provide them with the yoke, the two shutoffs, the expansion, everything that goes in the meter pit with the exception of the copper going to the house okay uh, the electric is a little <coughs> bit different the electric if they decide to go underground they're responsible from the house all the way to the pole if it is overhead then we provide the wire to the house and that is it and then the, of course the meter and you install the meter. and we install the meter correct Okay. Jason? Um, as you stated, ours is a little easier. Um, all I do is go out and inspect the tap into the main art itself. Everything that comes out of the house is approved by Green County. Come on, Hill District. And we do the actual connections. Your crew does the actual. No, the, no. the plumber, the contractor will usually core drill the connection into our main okay and then they'll insert and then i'll inspect everything the saddle that goes around it and then everything that goes into our main itself okay the connection itself yep. we we don't provide anything right? not as far as sanitary okay but i will say that one of the changes that is noted in the brief that we're asking for in section 104803 um that's because our current code our current code our current uh, codified ordinance does not have the the upgraded material in it it has the old what is it is it a glaze and tile yeah. type it's just a clean up of the language right and so um, jason asked that we update that while we're doing this we update that section to update it on the um can we be can we can we potentially make it 
a little bit more generic because I know that there are new products. Mm -hmm. People are looking at new products and maybe instead of absolutely specifying PVC, we could make it a little bit more generic or or say something about approved materials or something Jason other approved can, Jason and I can talk about that okay mm -hmm. um, I'm honestly a little surprised it you know these these cost differences aren't as much as I expected um, I mean Sydney I don't know what the heck they're doing mark better mark needs to get on the ball right. and start raising his rates mm -hmm. his his tap fees well yeah they're, the <laughs> Sydney's lower on on the the small end where where the meter is smaller but then once they hit a certain they they go a little bit well no I mean we're at higher than anybody mm -hmm. the 12,500 is nobody is anywhere close to that 12,500 Oh, Six on the current water. ones, yes. Yes, <clears throat> which is which is why Johnny wanted to change that to meter plus cost. And it and it mm -hmm. looks. I mean, I I obviously realize that although did we talk to anybody Bowling Green, they don't oh, charge okay. anything for electric. Mm -mm. I mean, and they're an amp community. Yeah. Did and we specifically look into any other amp communities? We well, Lebanon is an amp community, and they're on there. Or that no, we Where? took them off actually, didn't we? They, yeah, that's right. No, they were charging by foot. They was charging by foot because they some they require the customer to buy the wire from them just like they from like this. Right. And we actually sent out we actually sent out uh, an email through AMP, and I got several responses, but a lot of them were out of state, and I didn't feel like yeah. we should put those on there. Um, What's the C I M is material uh, cost uh, materials and cost? Uh, okay. I, I thought it was meter and co plus cost. Is that what you? Is it it's material? Is it? Well, it, the, it's all the materials, or is that your meter plus? Which? What's M? What's M plus C? Material plus cost. Because plus labor cost. We, right. We would we would buy the meter, and we would have a contract for. I mean, it would probably be better to put an L rather than C because, but okay. Okay. material and labor. Yeah. Um, so if we start with electric, what has been the rationale for not charging anything and why do other municipalities not charge anything? Because they don't have electric service. There's only one on here that's in, that has their own electric. Right. Well, that's we just talked about Bowling Green, right? They're an amp community, so. That, but they charge. But it's that no Bowling Green had no cost listed on their. <coughs> um, they had no cost listed on their tap fees for electric. So is there any logic to not? charging a tap fee for electric? I, or? I can't see what it would be. I mean, we have to put the meter into it and our crews have to install it and, you know, the larger you get on the meter, you know, the more it could potentially cost as far as when you're adding to going from a single phase and on up, so. I'd like to have more information about electric. I'd like to have specifically more information from AMP communities about electric. Okay, I, I can certainly include all of the, the ones I got yeah, I mean, it's, that were from out of state. I mean, I, I well, have them, but. Can, I mean, you, <coughs> can you make phone calls? I mean, sure. I, it seems like we, should, we can do some outreach to these electric superintendents and other communities. I, I guess I would say I don't have a problem charging for materials and labor that we have to provide for electric. It's not that much the recommendation two fifty, so um so the other question I have is these numbers are kind of all over the map. So I don't really understand the logic for why it's water sometimes cheaper and sewer sometimes more expensive or vice versa. I mean what's well, a lot of communities, I can tell you that on the sewer, a lot of communities charge extra for capacity. Um, for capacity, an, okay. Um, yeah, you're, you're selling your capacity in the system, and you can, can't therefore sell it to anybody else. And, and expanding your sewer, whether it's running a new line, increasing the, the capacity of your plant, or 
you know, whatever you're doing, it's going to cost a lot of money to dig mm -hmm. up the main because the sewer is it is quite a bit more expensive than water to run. Mm -hmm. And so the, the assumption is that once you sell that capacity, unless you do certain upgrades and put a lot of money into the system, you're not going to be able to sell any, you're going to reach a finite capacity. And so a lot of communities charge quite a bit more for that. I, the fee that Jason has suggested is relatively low for us in that. I mean, it's higher than some communities, but it, it's relatively low compared to others. No, well, it's actually higher than on the <coughs> study, except Arcanum. Well, and I guess that's my other question. So I think water I makes know, sense. It's, just, it's the same as uh, Farmersville, uh, our, our Mm -hmm. As far as sewer, you want to try to look at the four inch because that's a minimum that we can run a residential lateral. Mm -hmm. Your four inch and your six inch are going to be standard. So that's that's your threshold point is, is what you want to so, so are we gonna actually be offering these smaller sizes or okay. So though that seven fifty number really shouldn't be in those columns yeah, in those space. Four and six. Yes. It's going to be going to propose 375 to the 750. And then if we have anything larger than a six inch, it will double just like it does for every other. Okay. So I guess that's the other piece I want to understand. So um, I think I agree with Marianne. I mean, you know, cost and labor, or material and cost or whatever. I mean, that. That seems like you know the right thing to do, um, but Jason, based on what you said about sewer and and you know I guess what we have to do activity-wise, why 750? Where's that number coming from? The 375 that we proposed um, when we were dealing with the contractors, work we were almost getting laughed at. It was so low mm -hmm. because every other community around us charges so much more. Um, to make us competitive and to go out and to approve not only my time, at, but as far as capacity rates and everything else, it just brought us up to a, a more even. Okay. Well, and, and one thing that I would suggest to council um, that uh, you discovered when you talked to who that they put it into capital? Uh, Wayne Zerville, I spoke with uh, a council lady by the name of Kimberly from Waynesville. And what they actually gave their sewer plan away along with three other employees to Warren County because of uh, Warren County had more to do with the plan. So they they gave that kind of Warren County. Warren County took it off, but their tap fees were forty three hundred dollars for sewer and forty one hundred dollars for water, and they put that strictly into capital. For improvements that don't go into the general budget, it don't go back into the water fund. It goes it strictly into capital. And that makes a lot and, of sense. And they actually, she told me that they do at least two taps a month uh, for the water. And even though we have a relatively up, um, recently upgraded wastewater plant, we're building a new water plant. We still have the system to maintain, and we still have the maintenance on the towers and the plants and everything. I think it's a great idea to be able to put the tap fees into to capital. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. What size water lines are typical? Are you typically or meter? Uh, typical right now is uh, three quarter. For That's, for a home for residential, it's three quarter. I've we've installed maybe two one inch since 2014. Uh, and then we've had some four inch with new construction. So what are we what are we taking out Dayton Yellow Springs? What's that what size line is going down to the CBE? That's an eight inch. And then what would you anticipate is going into the CBE at probably, eight inch? Probably eight inch as well. Eight and then nine. what would you think? Um, They're going uh, to use a four inch water meter. They'll they'll <laughs> so, need four inch. Yes, okay. That's what size they had in Illinois. Okay. But, I mean, this would be a this would be a good source of revenue for our capital funds. I mean, for all of them to have these tap fees. Go it's 
it's also, I mean, I think we've got to analyze what it's going to do for the situations when we are waiving them because it's going to make these waivers mm -hmm. much more significant, um, is. which is a positive for um, the agency for Home Inc. That's pretty much what we've been waiving well in Antioch College, but it's, it's going to probably cause more question from other users and from other people um, that want to tap into the system. It's, it's the inequity is going to look a little um, Well, that, I think that's a separate issue. I mean, I think that we should be charging for whatever it is that we have to put out. And I'm fine with what staff has suggested. Well, and the, the last thing I'd like to point out is that I did include three pages from the city of Sydney's um, um, tap fee um, ordinance there. And they actually have an area along 75 where they apparently had to run a larger main to, to enable development there. Um, to accommodate it and so they actually charge quite a bit more in tap fees for that specific area It's listed separately in their tap fee code there on page two So we don't necessarily want to do that right now But it's something that we should keep in, in our minds for the future that if we have to run a main to uh, Accommodate some development that might be something that council wants to consider at that point you know, if, there are, if, it, if it isn't grant funded or something. How would we remember that? Well, the institutional member. Melissa's here. She remembers everything. Melissa. <laughs> so um, I would say, um, you know, I'd say you're getting positive response from, from council. I would say I definitely want more information on the electric mm -hmm. situation from other AMP communities. Um, anything else? I guess I'm like Harry Ann. I, you know, with the additional information, I, I still agree with what the staff has come up with. I, I, I do want to point out that that we are we are getting users. I mean, I absolutely agree that we should be charging, but. But every time we raise these fees, it is a disincentive for development. It, it, it's probably not huge, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm really unhappy to see this, you know, 12,500, which nobody else is anywhere close to. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that got there. Um, <laughs> so, um, I mean, it sounds like from at the high end, of development, we're actually going to get things under a little bit of control. I mean, would you anticipate that it's maybe will be maybe closer to where Sydney's? Um, I can give you a prime example on um, on Lisa and Southgate. I had a valve cut in, and it was on a six-inch line, and it was sixty-five hundred dollars. The valve itself was forty-five hundred. So that's something that me and the guys could not do, and it was sixty-five hundred dollars. That was for one valve. And that was, you said that was what, a six inch? That was a six inch. Wow. But you're also talking about a different style valve going into a live line versus a bolt on situation. Um, I could check, I believe the tap for uh, Xenia Avenue that Durst Brothers did was in the $12,000 range. Mm -hmm. And we can look on that because, because they, had, they hired it out as well. Those are huge means. Yep. And 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 we are getting we are getting revenue. I mean, at the end at the end of every one of these taps is revenue is is utility revenue. So um, the the valves are not cheap themselves. The right. sixteen inch valve that we have going to the water plant is almost twenty thousand dollars <coughs> for one valve. I you know something that I wanted that that I've talked to the Economic Sustainability Commission. That I'm going to work on is incentive policies and I just think that that's something that I I do think that these kinds of fees just as we're using them as incentives for home Inc I think that they can be used as incentives for other types of development so but I think that as as Marianne said that's a different that's a different discussion and we can um, if we have the policies if we can articulate it then we can um, look at that um, but um, I guess the, the other issue is what Patty raised, or maybe Johnny, about uh, putting the money into the capital improvements. Is that 
Does that make sense? I mean, if we're only covering our costs, yeah. it's it's money that we're already spending. So I don't. And it is coming I, out of operating. And, and I will tell you, say Waynesville is not a community to use as an example of any sort of fiscal management. So I'm. Please don't put that in the paper. <laughs> That's okay. so, but it's on the video. It's on the video. So, <laughs> so that, what they were doing is what they were doing. Who knows why they were doing it? Right. Well, I, I mean, so what I, I mean, I'm not saying that we have to like get the details on every community, but I would like to understand a little bit more just about where some of these numbers come from, um, just to make sure that we're thinking about all the considerations. Um, well, I mean, I, I will tell you that the information that I gathered was, uh, for the most part, off of their websites or through emails. Um, so I didn't really ask a huge amount of questions of anybody because I was just trying to find comparisons. Right. Well, maybe, you know, maybe just a couple, like Sydney, New Bremen, or whatever. I'm just... Well, I mean, again, I think, I think if we focus on the AMP communities, you can get the same information from some of these AMP communities. If you're contacting them about electric, you can contact them. And I'm actually going to be following up with some of these folks about whether they incentivize development, with if, whether they use utilities as a development incentive. Mm -hmm. So, so you know, it wouldn't be bad to kind of focus on all of us, you know, both of us focus on the same communities so that maybe we're only making one contact to these people. Okay. So maybe you and I can work on that mm -hmm. to okay. get, um, kind of get that collaborative information. But, but I have to agree with Mary Ann, any type of incentives or whatever you want to do should be separate right, from right. What, That's we, what, I said. what we want to set as rates. And, and, and I'd like to get this behind us and, and, and move forward because it looks to me right now we're losing money. We're losing about $250 over the water tap. Yeah. And that's just a reserve. And uh -huh. I, I would say short of having more information about the the electric taps that I'd like a better breakdown of the, the sewer as well. Um, I just I want to be able to explain, you know, what these why these changes in fees, just to be very clear. Um, it sounds like the water one uh, the water one looks clear to me. So uh, are we um going to pass this by resolution or ordinance? Ordinance. Or ordinance. Mm -hmm. So would we be ready for an ordinance or do you, the two oh, of you I want more? one more meeting, you know, one more bringing maybe a, a more information about electric and, and some of the detail that... that I guess I just want to say, I think this is pretty minimal. I mean, it's nowhere near the comparison to the upgrade, the utility costs that we've exposed people to. I mean, I just don't think it's that big of a deal. <laughs> but I have my say. I tend to agree with that. I just think we should explain it clearly. Like why, you know, what the 250 is covering, what the 750 is covering. It sounds like for the water, we've got the material costs so and the labor cost mm -hmm. so that's yeah i'm not questioning the amounts i just i guess let me clarify <clears throat> on the electric the electric is a minimal charge it's 250 dollars for residential and that includes the wire and the meter um when it comes to the electric for the commercial side like for the wastewater treatment plant then we had to buy a meter we had to buy cts we had to buy pts and it was over, I think it's almost $1,800. So that would be the aid to construction for businesses. Uh, we actually do charge a fee for um, net metering, and it is also $250 for the meter itself mm -hmm. and for the village to install it. That's what the electric will cover uh, is the meter and the overhead wire. Okay. So that really only leaves you want a more in-depth analysis of the sewer. Yeah, I mean, I think Jason responded to it. I just, it would be nice to have that on paper as well. Okay. Like with the others, just so, you know, when we are asked, we've got it. We can do that. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is 
pocket neighborhood concept presentation and I see our uh, zoning person here, Denise Swinger, to talk about that. past uh, 10 months or so, the Planning Commission has been working on a new section to the Zoning Code. Um, it's called Pocket Neighborhood Developments. We've had people that have read that in the paper over that 10 months and have had just this last meeting that we had a woman, uh, a senior, come into our Planning Commission meeting and was curious about what it meant and then told her story about how she does not want to leave this community, um, but she has nowhere to go. Um, she can't find a place to move from her big house into something smaller. And I think when we get the housing needs assessment going, we'll be able to discover just that, that we don't have smaller cottage-like housing. So what is a pocket neighborhood development? It's a, it's a type of planned community which consists of a clustering of smaller dwelling units um, typically they're individually owned on a single lot um, and they are managed by a homeowners association. They, they are centered around a courtyard or a common open space so it really lends itself to uh, more neighborliness, uh, more uh, promoting a sense of community and the people that live there tend to have an increased level of contact uh, and are more invested in the common open space because they do live closer together. Why have a pocket neighborhood development in the zoning code? Well, Planning Commission feels that it provides another mechanism for developing on infill lots, which is in line with the 2010 visioning uh, plan and the 2013 zoning code update for infill housing. Um, it's a way to provide housing density on parcels which might otherwise not be used um, at all or used for perhaps just one single family dwelling. Uh, they're neighborly by design, as I mentioned, as houses are built close together and neighbors have a shared interest in the common areas. There's less environmental impact because there's a reduction in roadways and hard surface areas and more increased pedestrian pathways to connect to. Um, PND zoning is an affordable housing option that fits with village values. Uh, PND zoning is also a good way to address the, um, what we're seeing here with our, our seniors, our older aging population, giving uh, boomers a chance to downsize. Got some uh, samples there of types of uh, pocket neighborhood developments. How does the PND differ from a planned unit development? In the code, we have planned unit developments, and, it, and it's set up as typically five acres or more. Um, although you, council has allowed them to be on less than five acres, um, there is a you have to, there's a rezoning process that you have to go through. There's a preliminary meeting uh, with staff, and there's a, a general meeting with a uh, preliminary meeting with. Planning Commission, then it goes to Council, then it goes back to Planning Commission for final approval and it can be a rather lengthy process. The pocket neighborhood um, would be on a lot of any size that's under five acres um, and um, as long as the zoning code requirements are met. Um, pocket neighborhood developments will have uniform zoning requirements. What the Planning Commission has done is they've written the PND uh, requirements to follow the existing requirements for residential A, B, and C. And so the only place that you can do these pocket neighborhood developments are in those residential districts. Uh, whereas um, PUDs are essentially spot, what we call spot zoning um, in that standards are written by the developer and then they're modified by the planning commission and then approved by council with each planned unit development having zoning requirements unique to that property. Um, obviously what happens with that is it makes post-development zoning enforcement very difficult. Although um, careful consideration um, would be given to the development, 
of pocket neighborhoods uh, with requirements on both the developer and the village to have the plans reviewed by a certified engineer. The process for a PND is less involved. And lastly, you're not going to have to do any rezoning at all with the pocket neighborhood developments as, a, as they will be a conditional use in the three residential districts. There's some examples of some PND site plans. As you can see here, the, yeah, it's just there's the street to the left, there's parking right at the entrance, and then all of the other space there is walkways getting to that, to the different individual housing. Go ahead. Um, that's another example where they have parking in a couple different places and also have a common area in the middle. That's the single cluster, and you can go ahead and go to the next one. This one is interesting. Um, it's the single cluster two. If you notice at the f on the right-hand side, there's two existing houses. So what happened was, and, and we do have cases in Yellow Springs where we have landlocked areas. So um, pocket neighborhoods could, could happen in, in that case too. Uh, you can see that where the one, the one existing house at the top facing the street then allowed for an access to get back to those uh, cluster of homes. And that's just another example of the same. Is there, is there um, accommodation for vehicles at the residence itself? No. Never? Mm -mm. Okay. I guess I'm just thinking if, this, if these are for seniors, that's what what we have what, what the in the conditional use requirements the uh, parking area has to be within 50 feet okay. of each of the units so it's going to have to be some creative ways where they'll put uh -huh. and they can have garages but the garages would be <clears throat> all in a row like a like a carport garage um, and then the pathway to get sorry. to the house is there a minimum or maximum area size area for these square footage for the home you mean no no for the pocket neighborhood itself you mean lot size? no i don't i mean oh, does it have to be at least an acre well what uh, yeah what, what we have in the code right now is you can have up to six units per acre in residential a up to eight per acre in b and up to 14 in residential c but there's no minimum or maximum size for the pocket a, neighborhood there, itself. We, we put in a minimum of four. Four so, units? Four units. Four, so it would have to be whatever, some portion there of There has that. to be yeah, at least four because you have the HOA. Two-thirds of an acre. Right, I mean, there has to be. be. There has to be, yeah. Otherwise, we could have, like, people just putting one house here and here and here. Right. And we've got so there has to be some sort of plan I mean there there has to be a plan there has to be an organizational and a, and a management a construction management and administrative after the fact way of managing the neighborhood right. because it's common area exactly. that has to be maintained exactly and what I found out about HOAs um, typically in Green County if the developer himself him, herself himself doesn't uh, create the lot lines pretty much invisible lot lines um, the Greek County engineer will do that. And so each of the houses will have a lot line. It could be just a paper lot line that you would see maybe if you went to GIS. But that lot, that area, the house and the ground beneath it, you pay the taxes on that. Um, then the common areas, there's no tax. And by law, they're not required to charge they're not allowed to charge tax for the common areas. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And, and that's what's the, the what's the percentage of what percentage of property do they around each residence? Is it like a few feet? Is we, it? A, we we are saying um, each it's ten feet between eaves. Is what and, and I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, this that this is just kind of the overview right now. But let me just review the. I already mentioned that's allowed in the three residential districts. The, so the density and minimum lot area requirements will follow the corresponding districts. So in a residential C, 50% of the um, area has to be, uh, well, I think that's RA, 50% of the area has to stay green or common open space. Um, I think that also maybe can include the parking as well. I'm not sure. I'll have to check on that. 
Um, the, the other thing with the PND being on a single lot, the setbacks will follow the perimeter. So if the setback is 20 feet, that's for the, that's for the perimeter of the property. And then the sides <coughs> perimeters as well. If it's 10 feet in that residential district, that's what they have to work with. Are these all single family? Typically they are single family, but Planning Commission decided to not go down that road completely and followed the zoning code and is allowing two family and single family attached in RB and RC, but they cannot make up more than 50% of the mix so that there's still <coughs> some diversity of housing options. Denise, would this include the, um, I know that when we were talking about Antioch College Village, there were some options that included um, uh, contiguous units that had a common living space, like a common kitchen and, and living room area, but had four individual apartments off of the sides. Is that anything that is permitted in a? No. Okay. Yeah, no. These are all, they're, they're individual dwelling units um, around that courtyard or common open space area. They'll have to have 200 feet of private yard and then a, a, and at least an additional 200 feet of common yard for each, each house. Um, so co-housing would be different. If somebody wanted to do co-housing, that would have to be a PUD. That's what she's talking about. But that would be a PUD. That would have to be on a PUD, yeah. Um, let's see, they, we are also going to allow up to 50% to be rented. Um, uh, no more, as I mentioned, no more than 50% can be two family or single family attached. And that's an and or in RB and RC. <clears throat> in residential A, they have to be single family. Uh, the common open space and parking areas under the HOA, uh, level B site plan review is gonna be required. We, we wanna have a village contracted engineer that approves the report and files a report to give to Planning Commission about the stormwater runoff. We want to make sure that the developer is, you know, is taking careful consideration with making sure that there's not going to be any impact on the neighbors. Denise, you just said that a maximum of 50% could be rented? Yes. And, and what's the purpose for that? Typically, they are just single family owned and they're not rented but the planning commission just felt just to because we have an issue with rental property that there should be no reason why they we, someone couldn't build it build it and use it as a rental so is there any um has there been any discussion on planning commission of how this could potentially interface with um the airbnb situation is there is there the ability for these to be short to be transient rentals. They really didn't consider that. Didn't it yeah, should probably didn't. be thought about. Mm. Yeah. I mean somebody could build an entire Airbnb community. No. Well only fifty percent could oh, be rent. Well they could yeah. still build a pretty big one. And if individual if individuals were um, subletting I mean, there could be a possibility of, you know, are, is it is it is it residents? Do they do people have to actually live? Yes. In the residence. Yes. Well, I mean, except we just, for the fifty percent rental. The fifty percent yeah. rental. Yeah. But with the parking being at a minimum, it could be very bad if that fifty percent were Airbnb. Right. I mean, it's something. Yeah, it's something yeah. to consider. Yeah. Um, and then if council approves the concept, you, you can go to the next one, I think. But, um, there's a set number, go ahead and go. We already kind of went through the, here we go. Sorry, <laughs> you go back, yeah. Um, the, there's eight sections of the zoning code this would affect. Uh, the design standards under the planning code um, will need to be amendment, amended to um, regarding the subdivision regulations. Uh, the schedule of uses residential districts obviously will add that as a conditional use in RA, RB, and RC. Uh, 126004 principal use per lot, PNDs will be added as an exception to the requirement of only one principal use per lot. And I think, what was the next one? 
go to the, is there, yeah. Then we'll add parking requirements. I think they went with 1.5 per uh, dwelling. And then we're gonna have some changes in definitions. Uh, well, we're going to remove, another uh, definition of this is called cluster housing, but we're calling this pocket neighborhood development. So we'll take out cluster housing. It doesn't happen to be anywhere, in, anywhere else in the code. Uh, and we'll replace it with pocket neighborhood development, the definition for that. Under um, the other definition, we're putting in a definition of HOAs. And let's see, the last one is the pocket neighborhood. And oh, we also added common open space. We made a definition of that. So um, it looked like, I thought I noticed on the August 21st meeting that, that this is um, being proposed to come back as legislation for the August 21st meeting. Is that, it will be two readings as an ordinance, is that correct? Or was it the September meeting? I think it's coming back August 21st. Um, yeah, but that it's gives, August but, 21st. So, it's so because council. you're not having a meeting, right, right which gives, will give a planning commission a chance to go back and add anything so we can talk about this as far as the rental and the Airbnb. Is, so is council inclined to keep that on the agenda or to, <coughs> I would agree. Yes. Is it something you're interested in? Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I am. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, we just feel, I mean, we really try to put a lot of things in place so the impact, on, especially in residential A, you know, we, we really hope that with between the requirements for the lot coverage, the requirements for the parking, the setbacks, um, we'll have other requirements on uh, making sure visibility, we'll, we're gonna work with people to make sure there's not an impact on, on neighbors. Okay. I have one question. Uh, is it thought that the houses would tend to be small or is that not necessarily the case? They all, they tend to be small. Planning Commission didn't put in a minimum um, because we don't have a minimum, but they tend to usually be between 800 and 1200 square foot per, footprint. Um, they also tend to be about 24 to 28 feet high. We didn't put that in either. We left them. You didn't as have high size requirements feet. at all. But just so it's just what is what's already in the code. Yeah. Yes. Dan. Dan. But come on out. Yeah. Perhaps don't go too far into this. Uh, Dan Reyes, I, I just wanted to ask a question on this, if I might, and maybe it's as much making a suggestion, if, if it's an agreeable question. Um, the, the village is a, you know, a, a known entity in most ways, and uh, yeah, familiar to all of us, and uh, uh, the new proposal uh, that was coming up, it, it seemed to me that we had some uh, sketches to look at that were abstract, general. But I, I'm kind of curious about the actual impacts on the village. And uh, if there might be some, whether planning has already done this, or might do it, uh, an inventory of applicable lots, or at least a sampling of applicable lots where uh, this new instrument might be used or implemented, rather than an abstract uh, representation of some elsewhere that's not in the village. You have to have some idea of how many lots or what might be an example of an actual lot. There is one being proposed for um, the Home Inc. property on Xenia Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, so there's one. Yeah. And I think that part of what we're asking for in the housing needs assessment is to identify the different places that something like this could potentially go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, because we know that we have um, you know, a couple of larger lots in the village that this would be perfect, you know, that could accommodate this, so. Are you, are you referencing specifically the density issue? Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I haven't read all of the details of what's proposed at this point. Uh, I could probably, you know, in, in a lot of ways just use my experience and imagination to project this onto the sort of different lot stock that is in the village. But I, my sense is that people probably don't get that right off if they hear this introduction to the uh, new category uh, that's being proposed. And it, it might help make it for, uh, you know, in a lot of ways clearer to people in the village to understand um, some of the examples that really prompt this. Well, it's also tough when we're talking about 
private property. Right. I mean, it, it's it's not in the villages or planning commission's role to to start to talk about what could or should happen to other people's private property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but our, our as we got into it, it was giving uh, people another, another option, mm -hmm. and we we did have uh, two people. Specifically, come so to there talk have been about some proposals. it. Yeah, right. and, and at our meetings, if people have voiced their opinions and so forth. So, uh, you know, we we didn't do it in the vacuum. Well, and I think we could. I mean, maybe we could have have the um, what is it, Glen Cottages? Glen Cottages, as, as as an example. I mean, if we want to, if we want to literally see a a site plan as to how it would how it would lay out in a site plan. Well, I think, but they haven't developed their full site plan yet, just phase right. one, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think much like the 2013 zoning code update, it took really a couple of years for people to realize, I can actually subdivide my lot now and create another lot. Um, it's catching on slowly, and I think that this is just another tool in that mm -hmm. development toolbox that we have that will give people an opportunity, wow, we can actually have a dense dense area right. and it meets our infill needs. And that was really the intent, one of the major intents of the zoning code rewrite was to allow increased density. Yeah. So you. I'm, you know, I'm up for it coming to the August 21st meeting um, as a first reading. And so Planning Commission will be revisiting it, so these couple of things that came up um, would be good. If I'm correct, Airbnb and, and it was something on rent also. I'm sorry? Airbnb, Airbnb just clarifying that piece. Short term, short -term, short -term rentals. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, next we have staff reports. Um, Patty, start with you. Okay, the uh, Runke contract, the extension on the Runke contract that council approved at the previous meeting has been signed, so we are contracted with Runke through August 31st of 2018. Um, the solar array, AEP and Dovetail Solar have started construction on the fence around the future solar array. Um, the, the fence is about half done and the excavation for the underground conduits has begun. We still expect the ribbon cutting in August, Johnny, is that correct? We'll update you in about two weeks. Okay. Um, Trying to find your <laughs> uh, So, um, but we do ask the, the citizens to remember this is a construction site. Um, I know that people are used to walking the glass farm and that, um, you know, it is a nice, beautiful, open area, but this is a construction site. There are um, excavated trenches out there and other things, so please do not walk back in the area where um, the solar array is being constructed. Are they doing anything to they are blockade it? They're yeah, it's, 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 but it's not being surrounded by tape or yeah, it's sense pretty, or anything? It's a pretty huge. Actually, the fence is almost 90% done. They actually was out there today. Um, so the containment, the solar field will be contained probably by the end of the week. Okay. Um, my concern with the citizens walking back here is, is they're bringing trucks and trailers and excavation equipment to unload semis and we got a tight turn in there by some trees and if somebody's walking around there you can't be seen right away and there's a potential that somebody could get hit. So we are going to put signage up to warn them not to be walking back here just for safety reasons. Uh, if they want to see back in there and they want to call Patty and schedule a time, we can take them back there and show them. I mean, it's an exciting thing for the village. So I had some people today from Cedarville that wanted to look at it, and I took them back here, showed them what was going on, and, and they was good with that. Okay, so. great. Okay. Um, Dayton Yellow Strings Road Infrastructure. Majors Enterprises is finishing up a job, and he should be back out there next week. They're going to mow it, and then they're going to start with the rest of the installation out there. Um, the Bryan Center parking policy, you see that's in there um, from the last meeting. We, we did have some problems um, with parking at the Bryan Center, so staff is working on a policy um, for when people have events here 
um, to try to make it safe for emergency vehicles to get in and out as needed. Um, the burning of the Sutton farmhouse has been delayed until September um, doing, uh, due to a problem with RAPCO, which is the state. Um, they have to give the permit to do that and they've kind of held that up a little bit. Um, the utility power uh, at the water plant has been completed and the project is still moving along ahead of schedule. The Bryan Center generator, um, Green County has been holding up that permit, but we hope to have that done uh, back to us by the 1st of August so that the crews can get that installed. The, new, the generator that was sitting out at Sutton Farm, and we've repurposed it now um, for the Bryan Center. As I mentioned, there will be the RCAP training on Thursday, and uh, this place is going to be packed. They'll be in the gym most of the day and then out in the field for the field demonstrations. Um, so please pay attention to the map closures, or, well, uh, to the closures that we'll post. Jason, if you can get those to me, we'll post those on Facebook for everybody to see. And I do have one announcement that is not on my, um, on my report. Um, I did post internally a, we have a vacant position for Director of Public Works, and I did post that position internally because I wanted to gauge the interest level and the qualifications of the internal candidates we have before posting it outside. Um, and so I have posted that, and Jerry has kindly consented to interview with me, the candidates, um, whomever applies internally. But I do not intend to fill this position until we have the final budget talks in the fall. Um, because I know, uh, I did get an email today from a concerned citizen who, who you know, wondered what kind of budget impact this would have. And so uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody understood that, um, yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to gauge the interest internally first, but we're not going to fill that position until we talk about the budget here in the next few months. Okay. That's Great. all I have. Melissa? I didn't put anything formal in the packet. Um, I've spent the last two weeks covering vacations, so just trying to keep myself afloat. And so. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Judy? Well, I do. Okay. This is a long one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we assisted Miami Township Fire Rescue with one overdose so far this month. Subject was transported and is in good condition. Um, the PD has started a park and walk routine, which mm -hmm. you are aware of. Um, Officers will be parking in residential areas and walking for a few blocks. Um, I'd like to ask, if you have the time, step out as a resident, introduce yourself. Um, the officers uh, would love to you know, meet, have a conversation, um, and don't be alarmed if you see them walking by. I actually walked with uh, Officer Meister this evening myself. Fantastic. Um, we are seeking volunteers to assist for the following two projects. They're just in the initial stages, but I'm excited about them. One is uh, basketball with, with cops in, in the Bryan Center gym this winter. Um, also, we're, we'd like to sponsor a movie night with the PD, which I think could be fun. Maybe once a month, uh, blankets, pillows, popcorn. Here in the gym? In the gym. Um, and so we're, we're looking for volunteers as well as uh, anyone to help us with the technical side of this. <laughs> Contact me anytime if, you, if anyone's interested. Always, as always, interested in feedback regarding interactions with the officers. Um, I'll be, uh, as often as I can, weekly sending out an email to council with some of the little things that have taken place during the week that citizens yourself may not be aware of, but I think have merit in all of us knowing. It also brings us a little closer to uh, the relationships between ourselves and, uh, and council. So um, two things. Brian, I'd like to thank you for the Rails to Trails uh, working with us for the donation on bicycles. So we found a great way to uh, facilitate rather than selling bicycles on gov deals, um, we now donate them to Rails to Trails and through several sponsors we'll find some uh, kids who need bikes. The rest of the bicycle parts and pieces that we can't use will be donated 
to a school in Springfield that teaches uh, kids how to repair bikes. So thank you for that, Brian. Question for council. Patty gave me permission to ask. I would like to, I know we're going to be redoing the parking lot here soon and talking about those things, but in the meantime, I'd like to see if you are okay with us uh, removing the giant U's that are at the turnaround right here. Um, we've had some issues with animals and some security issues uh, at night. We can't see past them. They're de they've definitely reached their, their term. Uh, and these are large evergreens, not a type of sheep. Oh. I like it. <laughs> So yes. please remove them. Please. <laughs> Those things are so ugly. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure. And any questions or anything? Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, I I did send Brian a note saying that uh, um, when we get ready to to walk the uh, uh, West South College at Wright Street up to Enon Road, Omar Circle, Paxton Drive area with one of the officers. Appreciate that, Jerry. And I think Saturday's our first uh, uh, Black Awareness uh, in tour. Yeah. And so at, I think that's at 1 o'clock at the hotel. Mm -hmm. Anyone wants to join, I'll be there. Um, I'm excited. My father will be coming to town, and he's going to uh, spend the day with me there and the night, uh, the evening with my family. So nice. if you see us, we'll be out. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Judy. Yeah. It's been busy, lots of public records requests lately. We accomplished the proper destruction of a lot of outdated records last month, and then Records Commission met again on Friday to update the RC2 that's now gone into Ohio History Connection for, I hope, approval to better accommodate some of the PD's records so that they can get rid of a lot of a backlog, hopefully. Um, I will be gone for a long time. Do not rent my office as an Airbnb, please. And I'll be back in to work on the 7th. And I just wanted to thank council for mm -hmm. several years ago agreeing to cancel that first August meeting so that folks could take vacation. I really appreciate it. And Kathy Gudgel will be in the office 90 noon, Monday, Wednesday, Friday to pick up public records requests, emails, voicemails, all kinds of stuff. And Ruth Ann's going to help her with that as well. So thanks to everyone. And Judy, why are you making regular phone check-ins? Why don't you just do, to, if somebody really needs something, well, they fine. can text you or they can call you. But well, no, they can't actually. Oh, it's because of island. where you are. Oh, uh, Vinyl Haven yeah. doesn't have. Uh, well, how about this? How about if we need you, we'll text you, and when you hit the mainland, you can check your phone, and if there's nothing there, you don't have to call. Yeah. Yep. We'll do. Have fun. Thanks. So, future agenda okay, item. Oh. I, I like to thank Denise for putting her little report in around planning, zoning, and economic sustainability, so we kind of see what what that type of traffic and activity that she's doing as a zoning person. Right. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. You know what, Karen, before you do that, I did this really bad thing, probably completely subconsciously left out the council reports section, and it's the second meeting of the month, and oh, we do that. So. Okay. Um, so, okay, council, I don't have the list, but... Oh, start there and start just, we'll start with Marianne to do reports. Well, I was not at the last HRC meeting. I was out of town. I frankly, I wasn't prepared. I don't remember what we did with anything else. Okay. So, you know, okay. Well, I, I guess I can say in terms of the Environmental Commission, we've been working on the um, climate action plan, sort of trying to move pieces of that together. As I mentioned, the other project on the glass farm is moving along the uh, wetlands construction. I haven't met with the mediation program. I, I know the Justice Task Force has been meeting. I didn't go to that last meeting. Number. Okay, Jerry. Okay, for planning, uh, Denise gave the report on pocket, pocket neighborhood. Uh, we also had, had some discussions about um, the, re the report. 
Um, I call it blank. Um, that we're gonna, we said we're going to take up in August. Comprehensive plan. Comprehensive plan. Comprehensive plan. Comprehensive plan. Yeah, we're going to be taking that up in August. Okay. Um, so the Economic Sustainability Commission um, is now um, able to focus on two key goals. One is uh, uh, reestablishing the revolving loan fund. So we are hoping to have a proposal recommendation for council. Um, ideally in August, but we'll see how that goes. And the second thing that Karen referenced was the uh, village incentive policy. Um, so really kind of formalizing uh, what incentives, if any, we would offer. And um, so we expect a recommendation uh, on that for council as well. Um, a very exciting thing besides the new veto award that I mentioned at the House of Ohm. Uh, so definitely show up uh, for the event on the 24th. But also um, the Arts Council, um, actually Nancy Mellon has uh, attended our last two meetings and we are talking about um, bringing the Arts Council's permanent collection back to its proper home, which is the Bryan Center. And uh, that would mean that we would have art on a regular basis, so we're still working on that. And um, Patty, there'll be some things that I think Nancy will want to talk to you about as well, um, just related to you know responsibilities with curating and whatnot. Um, but that I think will be amazing. And um, you know, part of that is contingent on what happens currently. It lives at um, AUM. Um, but the idea of having it closer to our community members to enjoy uh, is pretty exciting. Okay, I mentioned uh, the chamber meeting that's happening um, this Thursday about cybersecurity. Um, and the RPC, we did not have a, um, a July meeting, and actually I don't think we're having an August meeting. And um, regional planning, we have a meeting tomorrow. Um, there is a huge, the, the new um, uh, cluster mailboxes mm -hmm. that are now going to be required in all new development, that's something for you. Are you following <coughs> up on that? Yeah. Because it's, I mean, they are, they are holding fast. There were three people from the post office there. Mm -hmm. They are holding fast to that. And they're really not anything new, absolutely. Um, they're going to require that. So um, clearly, it makes more sense for it to be built into the development so that it can be um, a logical, logical access and, and visually appealing. So um, that's important. Um, and it's not going over well with a lot of developers, I can tell you that. Um, and interestingly enough, Green County Regional Planning and the trustees didn't care. They have no sympathy for the developers, which is very unusual. So that was interesting. Um, basically said, you know, the post office is making a making a rule. We're not gonna we're not gonna worry about it. So you got to follow it. Um, I think that's really about it as far as Green County is concerned. Um, I think that there may have been a couple of other communities in, in Green County, specifically uh, Beaver Creek Township that actually was part of a uh, medical marijuana uh, zoning or medical marijuana application. So I know that they did, um, they were working with somebody and they did approve the zoning for at least one facility. Um, so I think that's probably it for my stuff. Um, so future agenda items, um, uh, we are not meeting in August. The first meeting in August has been canceled. We've been doing that for a few years now, so um, people can all get a break. Um, our next meeting will be August 21st. Um, a resolution um, consenting to the Gustaf Gustafson annexation is on the agenda. Ordinance imposing a lodging tax. Um, financials for July. Um, tap fee increase discussion. Um, I guess we did actually say to just go ahead and bring bring legislation. Did we? No. Oh, no, no, no. One you more. More yeah. One more discussion. One more discussion. And then the pocket neighborhood zoning. Um, and you wanted council goals feedback on, on the 21st? Well, let's just keep it on the 5th because I think that's going to be a busy meeting. Okay. So let's, you've got it on the 5th. 
Um, we are going to need a, uh, a six o'clock executive session um, on the August 21st meeting um, for um, um, personnel, uh, personnel issues that we'll figure out the proper language for. Um, and I would like to take the liberty of um, because of the of the of the maybe difficulty understanding or confusion around the lodging tax, I would like to ask Chris to talk about what exactly is being proposed and what this legislation for um, on the 21st will look like because I don't know that it's been clear to everyone and I want all citizens to understand um, what council is talking about being covered. Is that okay? Can sure. you do that? Chris, can you review the... Yes. I, and I have a couple things for the yeah, but now, Like too. now. Oh, now, sure. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted a couple things about the agenda. Okay, well... Let's, let's hear from Chris and then we'll talk about that. Closer than usual. Um, well, fundamentally I think that I'll, I'll just get, kind of give an overview of what I envision the legislation to look like conceptually um, because I think council will still need to weigh in on some of the details because there's some policy aspects to it. But um, fundamentally I think that people have to understand that there are, there are three broad context. Words have been thrown out that have common meaning, um, but they have, uh, under the law, specific meaning. So the lodging tax, as I understand it from um, uh, the, the public discussions that we've had, is really intended to capture transient guests. That is defined under the Ohio Revised Co Riot Code of uh, individuals or, or groups, or whatever it might be, but they rent a room uh, or for 30 days or less. That is the definition that's used throughout the state. That a lodging tax uh, is intended then to capture someone who is in, who operates a facility that rents one room up to more, whatever that is, but the guest stays for 30 days or less. And uh, within our zoning code, we also have a definition for short-term rental. That is somewhat confusing. <coughs> A, a, a lodging tax for transient guests is not the same thing, same, same thing as a short-term rental. Um, currently under our zoning code, uh, the, uh, there is an application process because a short-term rental would be a conditional use. So we, the council has to consider whether or not a person who wants to operate a, uh, a business for purposes of transient guests, whether or not that should be a conditional use or a permitted use. Um, some considerations for that would be that um, there would be a registration process of some kind for those engaged in the business. That way the village would know who's doing what and there would be a means to track who's responsible for paying the, uh, the lodging tax. It, there has been, uh, we've reviewed sample ordinances, or not samples, but ordinances from other uh, communities, um, and uh, there's a way that we can create an enforcement mechanism that is not uh, that is not a burden, that's not draconian, that's not harsh. It simply says, please register the business. The burden to pay the lodging tax is upon the guest, the transient guest. However, the responsibility of collecting that tax falls to the operator of the business. Um, and then, of course, the, we know that the uh, percentage of the tax can be up to 3%. Um, so what I would envision is that there would be a presentation to council, or we would present to council, an ordinance that would have the structure that would go into our codified ordinances that would include uh, what the purpose of the lodging tax is, definitions of what a transient guest is, what uh, establishments the lodging tax is, uh, lodging tax is meant to um, be imposed upon, which in this case would be uh, someone who's engaged in the business of winning, renting one room or more to a transient guest of less than 30 days. Um, in addition to that, there will be a mechanism that I'll have a chance to go over with Patty and Melissa 
on how the village would go through the registration process, figure that out so that it's not burdensome. Again, we've got some templates that other communities have used that, uh, that seem to, to work pretty well. So the idea here is, is that we don't want to overburden village staff. We don't want to make it a cumbersome process for villagers who are engaged or others who are, would be required to register. And we want to make the ability to capture this percentage, up to 3%, um, it really as simple as possible. Um, and then uh, the village could again, uh, you know, use that revenue and go towards the general fund. So that, that's a that's a high okay. level concept. I mean, and I think that's great. I mean, I think I think that that is a good, you know, I I didn't intend for there to be discussion or you know debate on council. It was more just to kind of frame the discussion a little bit more definitively. And and so I think you did that. I don't. So I have a question. So within this, that would I assume include people who rent out an apartment or a house as a short-term rental? That what we want to use the word <laughs> transient guest because short-term rental is not is not the terminology. Short -term. As people who rent out an apartment or house for transient guests and people who rent out bedrooms for transient guests. Yes, that yes. the intention is yes to capture yes. that business okay. activity with one room or uh, one room. Okay, got it. So that all that all of those people engaged in that that enterprise would be treated. And so, equally. therefore, if a council person does either of those things, they will they what is it ipso facto <laughs> have a conflict of interest and will not be uh, voting on this. Correct? You need to recuse. No, I checked with the ethics commission, and uh, there would not be a reason for a council member solely on the basis of the fact that they may operate uh, such a business to recuse themselves. From and we've got enough time if council would like me to get it would take a couple of weeks but i can get a formal opinion from the ohio huh. ethics commission on that before the august 21st meeting which might make some sense just so there's no misunderstanding there so if council so directs me i, I shall do makes, it makes sense okay okay so we're thanks chris that that was helpful thanks so we're we're still on track for that ordinance at the august 21st meeting okay anything else so, what yeah um to, uh, regarding the housing needs assessment process, um, I'd like to know if council is comfortable with uh, Patty and probably Karen and I working on the housing needs RFP and not coming to council for approval. That's question one. And the other thing is that I, I'd like to come to the next council meeting with a initial proposal for a task force, housing task force, for just discussion purposes only. And why would, why are you proposing the RFP would not come to council? Um, in case, well, I'd like to be able to have it done uh, by the, well, I guess it could. It probably won't really be done before the August 24th, 1st. Initially, it was a timing thing. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you wanted to let it by the end of August, correct? So, I mean, that's yeah. the end of that's August. Still, the meeting is the end of well, August. No, it's, it's the 21st. The 21st. So, so we yeah. could, it could still come to council on the 21st and get comments and. We'll we'll have at least a draft done. I, yeah. I have some. I've yeah. done a little bit that we're meeting in the yeah, morning. Yeah, so. so. Okay. So. And I think the work on the task force sounds great. So you so we will do a housing needs assessment discussion or yeah. RFP, RFP review. Yeah. And you know, and, and whether we whether we take the time maybe at that point council can decide if they actually need it to come there maybe it can be passed with a motion because it's been decided, right, that we do not need legislation for an RFP. Not right? for an RFP, just you need it to let the contract after the RFP. Okay. So it, you know, we have done legislation for RFPs. If council is so inclined, after we discuss it and you review it at the next meeting, perhaps you'll decide that that isn't that step isn't necessary. So you're saying, Marianne, the task force also, or, or do you want to maybe? I'd like to come maybe on the with fifth. May, uh, a proposal, a draft proposal. Okay. What about for discussion? What about the fifth? Doing that on the fifth. Okay. Just because we've, we're getting a really full agenda right. on the 21st. Okay. Okay. And what, what are you calling a housing task force? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, we don't have a lot um, farther down the agenda. I'm sure that will grow. Okay. Uh, and we actually do need a very short um, executive session for the purpose of the discussion of potential litigation. If I could get a motion for that. So moved. Second. Winter. Yes. Pouch. Yes. Sims. Yes. Queen. Yes.